Good morning. My name is Councillor Gord Perks. I am the chair of the Toronto East York Community Council. The clerk has confirmed that we have quorum, so I'd like to now call meeting 31 to order. Welcome everyone. Today's meeting is being held by video conference. City staff are also connected to the meeting by video conference. The public will continue to participate electronically and can watch the meeting streaming live at youtube.com slash Toronto City Council Live. I ask everyone for their patience with any delays and technical issues. We are doing our very, very best in trying circumstances. The clerk staff have connected all registered speakers to the meeting by audio. The list of speakers can be viewed online by visiting the Toronto and East York Community Council page at toronto.ca slash council and clicking the speakers box for today's meeting. Clerk's IT staff will also be available to assist members with their devices. As part of each agenda item, I will ask members to raise their hand or unmute their microphones if they wish to question staff or speak. I will then create a speakers list and will call on members when it is their turn to speak. When voting on an item or motion, I ask that members ensure that their video is on and to raise their hands to indicate their vote. Members, I want to remind you that you must submit and approve your motions by email. Staff are available at teycc at toronto.ca to help with motions. Although we are meeting in different locations and meeting remotely today, the Community Council would like to acknowledge that the lands we are meeting on are the traditional territories of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nation, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Are there any declarations of interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act? Seeing none, I need a motion to confirm the meeting minutes from our last meeting held January 6, 2022. Councilor Cressy, all those in favor, opposed, carried. Okay, that's step one out of the way. We'll now go to the agenda run through. Members will begin the run through of non timed items at item 31.27. I'll just give you a minute to get there. The first item is TE 131.27, changes to business improvement area boards of management. Uh, I'll move the recommendations in there. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE 31.28, designation of fire routes, an amendment to Chapter 880, fire routes, 118 Merchants Wharf. Councillor Cressy. I'll move the staff recommendations. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE 31.29, noise exemption permit refusal appeal, 55 Charles Street East. Councillor Wong Kam. Uh, yes, thank you very much. I'd like to move rock, um, recommendation number one and to refuse the application. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE 31.30, 3239 through 3251 Dundas Street West, zoning bylaw amendment application preliminary report. I'll move the staff recommendations. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item 31.31, 39.47 Camden Street, Zoning Amendment Application, Preliminary Report, Councillor Cressy. Uh, I have an amendment uh, from staff on expanded notice, and with that I can move the, the recommendations. Okay, give everyone a moment to look at that. Thank you. All those in favor of the motion and the item together, opposed if any, that carries. Item 31.32, 18 Portland Street and 1 through 9 Niagara Street, zoning amendment application, preliminary report, Councillor Cressy. I, I have an amendment from staff, and with that I can move 
if that can be placed, but that I can move the staff recommendations. If I could just note, uh, as this may be the prelim report, but we had our public consultation meeting last night. Uh, and as staff indicated at that meeting, it is my expectation that a refusal report uh, is coming uh, very short. Thank you. Okay, taking the amendment and the item together, all those in favor, opposed, carry. Item TE 31.33, 595 Bay Street and 306 Young Street, official plan and zoning bylaw amendment application, preliminary report. Uh, Councillor Layton uh, contacted me and said he's been delayed, so I will hold that until he is here. I expect him shortly. Item TE 31.34, 320328, and 332 Bloor Street West Zone Bylaw Amendment Application Preliminary Report. I will hold that for Councillor Layton. Item TE 31.3569, York. Bill Avenue, official plan amendment and zoning amendment application preliminary report. I will hold that for Councillor Layton. He's attending to a matter, an urgent matter in the ward, I understand. Item TE 31.36, 57 through 93 Beloyal Street. Zoning bylaw amendment and rental housing demolition application preliminary report. Councillor Matlow. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. I'm going to move the preliminary report. And I just want to uh, make uh, one mention to any residents who might be watching that there are a number of preliminary reports on this agenda, all in the Davisville Village uh, neighborhood. And what I'm going to try to do is work with planning staff to organize a single meeting for these area uh, uh, development applications so that we can look at the site specific uh, uh, proposals, but also consider the cumulative impacts to the neighborhood as well. So uh, with that, I'll, uh, I'll be moving the other ones as well. Okay, so we'll take three, six. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE 31.37. 289 through 299 Beloyal Street, Zoning Amendment Application Preliminary Report, Councillor Matlow. I'll move this as well. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE 31.38, 596 through 573 Christie Street, Zoning Bylaw Amendment Application Preliminary Report, Councillor. Oh, I believe there's a deputation. Yeah, there are deputations on that. So we'll hold that for deputations. Item TE 31.39, 50 through 64 Merton Street, Zoning Amendment Application Preliminary Report. Councillor Matlow. Move the report. All those in favor, opposed, carried. <coughs> Excuse me. Item TE 31.40. 5 through 15 Ragland Avenue Zoning Amendment and Rental Housing Demolition Applications. Preliminary Report, Councillor Mappo. I move the staff recommendations. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE 31.41, 1196 through 1210 Young Street and 2 through 8 Birch Avenue. Zoning Bylaw Amendment and Rental Housing Demolition Applications. Preliminary Report, Councillor Mappo. Move it. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE 31.42102 Berkeley Street, Zoning Amendment Application Preliminary Report, Councillor Wong Tam. Uh, thank you very much, Chair, and good morning, everyone. I would like to move uh, an, an amendment to the staff recommendations. Uh, this is an amendment that everyone has seen before. One is to expand the notification area. Two is to ensure that the meeting has appropriate accessibility supports. Uh, also to direct the city uh, staff, the planning staff, to uh, establish a site plan as well as a rezoning uh, working group. 
uh, as they deem appropriate and to ensure that that happens before any final approval. Um, and just like uh, Councillor Matlow, uh, there are eight preliminary reports for Ward 13 that has just come in. Uh, we recognize that the, the development sector is is basically, you know, getting everything through as quickly as possible before changes uh, through the planning regime, including inclusionary zoning. Uh, this is going to create a lot of additional work for planning staff. I've spoken to this issue at great length now about needing to resource our staff so we can, they can handle these applications that are also very complicated to review. Um, and so uh, I will be working with staff, planning staff, to try to do the very best we can to streamline the applications. Um, but like uh, Councillor Matlow has expressed, uh, there's only so many evenings in a, in a, in a week, and uh, we're going to probably end up doubling them up. And some of our neighbourhoods are going to see the proportionate impact of seeing four or five applications all coming to fruition at the same time, which means that they make their approvals or or not at the same time. But block after block, uh, downtown Toronto, midtown, all the uh, growth centers, they're being blown up. There's not going to be a lot of sidewalks left. And if you think that you've lost your bike lane now, uh, wait uh, a year and you'll see what's going to happen. Um, so I just want to preface that because I'll be moving the same amendment on all eight applications. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, and I'll just uh, note and endorse your remarks. We're all we're all experiencing this. Um, so we'll take the amendment and the item together. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Item TE thirty one point four three two nine six through three hundred King Street East and fifty six through sixty Berkeley Street official plan. And zoning bylaw amendment application preliminary report, Councillor Montan. Uh, yes, thank you very much. I'll be moving the uh, sim the same amendment, and just note that this is the second application of this meeting coming into uh, uh, the Corktown uh, uh, pocket of our city, Corktown West Onlands. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I uh, will take the amendment and the item together. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. patient with me guys i've got a lot to manage here item te 31.44 130 through 134 parliament street and 529 richmond street zoning bylaw amendment application preliminary report councillor wong town thank you i'll be moving that same uh, amendment and this is the third application in the uh cork town cabbage town west online catchment area okay Taking the item and the amendment together, all those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE, whoops. Item TE 31.45, 225 through 229 Queen Street East and 120 through 134 Sherburn Street, zoning bylaw amendment application preliminary report, Councillor Wong-Tang. Uh, thank you, I'll be moving the same second, uh, set of amendments and this is our application in Moss Park, directly across from the construction of the Ontario line where Moss Park is located. So you can imagine it's going to be busy with construction. Thank you. Can I say that I'm not filled with envy? one is uh we'll take the amendment and the item all together all those in favor opposed carried okay that's five <sighs> te 31.46 410 sherburn street zoning bylaw amendment application preliminary report councillor montan uh, thank you very much. This is another application on Sherburn, but it's north of Moss Park and it's just around the corner from Allen Gardens. Uh, it's also known as the Phoenix, uh, and this particular uh, motion will have one additional component uh, to the amendment. Uh, the Phoenix is a very important cultural facility. It is a concert hall that we are losing many of them in our city, especially when it comes to music venues. Uh, we'd like to uh, uh, not just have a, a traditional working group, but have a working group that includes the music office so that we can do everything we can to try to find a way to save these important facilities. 
um, and uh, and nothing should be approved, including the final report, uh, as well as the site plan, until we find a resolution to make sure that we can retain uh, the cultural music venue. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, on the amendment and the item together, all those in favor, opposed, carry. Item TE 31.47, 64 through 66 Wellesley Street East, and 552 through 570 Church Street, official plan and zoning bylaw amendment, and rental housing demolition applications, preliminary report, Councilor Wong Tan. Uh, thank you. I believe I have to hold this item down. We're still working on the amendment. Okay. Item TE 31.48, 49 through 51 Young Street, Zoning Bylaw Amendment Application Preliminary Report, Councillor Wong Tan. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I would like to move the, uh, the amendment. Okay, if we can just have that up. Okay, thank you. It's the same amendment. And this time it's a mixed use uh, building, condominium on top of a podium coming into the financial district, which we don't see very often. Oh, right. Interesting. Okay. Uh, on the amendment and the item together, all those in favor, opposed, carried. Um, Mr. Chair. Yes. Uh, I was just advised that I'd no I don't need to hold uh, 47, item 47. I can let that go. Okay. Uh, and also move uh, a set of amendments. Um, this is uh, oh, a development. 47 now. Okay, okay sure. Yeah. Uh, this is a development right at the northwest corner of church and wellesley um it is uh it's got a very long and storied application to it uh, originally appealed to the ontario municipal board um and in one of those rare occasions where the city prevailed uh so the ol omb slash olt sided with the city staff um and we were able to um, uh, defeat the application uh this is the same applicant they've come back um largely um trying to, I guess, adhere to some of the conditions and the comments of the OLT ruling. Uh, this is going to obviously change the face of the village uh, if it's approved. Uh, and uh, there are, of course, significant impacts, including uh, the demolition, the requested demolition of a rental uh, apartment building. Uh, what we're looking for here is fine grain retail. At base, we want a podium that's going to make sense in the community. But we also want a building that's going to add significant cultural uh, space for the LGBT community and to make sure that those who are going to be uh, displaced potentially through the demolition of that apartment building uh, is going to be housed. Um, this is obviously very disruptive. Uh, we host a lot of festivals and parades in the village. Um, and when you have a, an entire block that's uh, being blown up, uh, that could uh, change everything. Um, so I just wanted to flag it because this is an application that was originally refused at the OLT. Developers come back, made some changes, and now we have to go through another planning review after a three and a half year um, uh, uh, battle and then a set of negotiations. That's a lot of time and energy um, put out by all members of the community. Uh, I just want to thank them if they are watching for their patience. Uh, I think they recognize that uh, City Council doesn't control how applications come in. But I just wanted to flag that um, we're about to embark on another conversation about the same location. Most of the, um, the building performance stays the same. The only thing they've done is taken a haircut on the, on the height of the building. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, on the amendment and the item together. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Okay, that was... Seven. Item TE 31.49, 619 through 637 Young Street. And one through nine, Isabella Street, official plan and zoning bylaw amendment application, preliminary report, Councillor Wong Pan. Uh, thank you very much. This is, I believe, our last preliminary report. I have an amendment. It is the same amendment that we would have, uh, I would have moved on the previous seven 
preliminary reports, uh, again, asking for uh, expanded notification, the site plan rezoning uh, working group. Uh, there's also attached to this, I should say, it's been attached to all the uh, all the uh, amendments, a, a construction management working group as well. Um, and of course, to bring all the local stakeholders in here. Uh, this is another, you, you've heard the story before, another block of Young Street uh, under uh, development review. Uh, and of course, there's going to be significant impact. Um, and uh, not to mention, we keep trying to <laughs> improve the quality of public realm, but it's awfully hard to do uh, when uh, time and time when we're ready to move on some type of improvements. We have to delay those public realm street improvements because we have another development um, uh, uh, site. So uh, it's very, very hard, of course, to build beautiful neighborhoods when we're constantly under construction for private development. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, on the amendment and the item together, all those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE31.50, Liberty Village Public Realm and Community Services and Facility Study Update Report, Councillor Cressy. Uh, I'll move the staff recommendations and extend uh, my sincere thanks to the team from City Planning and other divisions who have been working on this, and very happy to move the staff reps. Okay, all those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE31.51, Construction Staging Area Time Extension and Traffic Amendments, 524 Oakwood Avenue, Councillor Matlow. This is in support of the NIA Center's uh, uh, improvements, so I'm very happy to support uh, this extension. All right, all those in favor, opposed, carried. Okay, item 3152 is a construction staging area, 387 through 403 Bloor East. There is a deputation on that item. So we'll hold that. Item TE31.53, construction staging area time extension, 191 through 201 Church Street at Dalhousie Street, Councillor Wong Tan. Uh, yes, thank you. I do have an amendment. If the clerk can put that on the screen. Uh, thank you very much. Um, we're going to be amending the, uh, the recommendations uh, with the following. Uh, ensuring that the applicant can provide a, a fully covered, protected, uh, unobstructed, wheelchair accessible pedestrian walkway uh, that, uh, that they would have to bear on their own cost. They have to ensure that there's a 24-hour hotline that's accessible to the public and visible from their construction board. Um, we need to also ensure that uh, any light pollution will be mitigated by installing shield and barriers for the light so that light cascades down and not up. Um, and to, uh, and, uh, and that, the, that the applicant needs to uh, work with the uh, local community by providing monthly construction progress reports or as needed. Uh, and, uh, and that information should go directly to the residents associations as well as the BIA uh, and any other important stakeholders. Um, this is a, obviously an extension uh, a, a report from city staff, from transportation staff, and I want to note that you know there's a reason why we we limit the the extension request. So therefore, if you come in and you ask for three or four years of closing the roads, um, the reason why we have to limit it is because sometimes along the way things go wrong, and in this case, um, things have, have uh, can be improved. And the recommendation before you is to try to get. The construction impacts to a minimal uh, because the, the, they are very, very disruptive, especially when you have th like six development right, and basically encasing the entire block. Um, thank you very much. Okay, one moment. <sighs> Okay, uh, we'll take the amendment and the item together. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item 
Item TE 31.54, Construction Staging Area, 244-260 Church Street, Councilor Montana. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, I'll be moving a set of amendments to this uh, staff report. And for sure, this committee has seen it before. Uh, essentially, uh, once again, we're trying to rein in the construction impact. I, I know I sound like a broken record, but it has to be said for the public record is that our communities, um, of course, uh, welcome development. We know that housing is important. Uh, however, uh, you know, it is highly unfair when everyone has to live with uh, it in sort of surround sound. During the pandemic, the uh, the premier uh, basically overrode the construction uh, the construction noise bylaws of the city, and it made life very, very difficult. This motion and the motions that um, that speak in the same spirit of trying to mitigate impacts is always about improving the quality of the construction site, reducing sound, building better coordination and communication mechanisms in there so the developer, not city planning, not transportation services, not the council's office, but the developer is out there building good relationships by ensuring 24-hour construction hotline number is visible, having someone to answer the phone when constituents complain, ensuring that the site is always swept and clean and, and power wash when necessary. Um, I could go on. You've heard me say it before, but for, for goodness sakes, I don't know what it is, but the developers, once they get their road occupancy permit, I'm not saying this one, but, you know, in general, once they get their road occupancy permits and their final approvals from, from city council, it's almost like they don't care. So we have to rein them in. And so that's why we're going to limit the time of when you get these uh, when you get these extensions if you're asking for five years no way you can have one year and then we'll work towards improving the site until it gets perfect and um, and i just want to thank the community because uh you know the the, the construction staging that i just approved uh, represents another uh block of, of literally a, a section of their sidewalk uh removed uh roads closed and re-diverted um, it is very, very challenging. It's not just one development file. It's the cumulative effect. And, and that's what we're living with in downtown Toronto. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And uh, taking the amendment and the item together, all those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE 31.55, Construction Staging Area, Time Extension 485 Logan Avenue, Councillor Fletcher. Yes, I have a motion here, Mr. Chair, please. I believe, I believe the clerk will have it. Yep. Everyone has it. Thank you very much. It'll be up in a moment. Thank you. There's written notice, the CLC construction. This is an extension. It's been very difficult with all the snow and there's a bike lane there. Um, they cannot park illegally, that uh, the conditions are not met. We get down to that, number 13. Um, we could just scroll down a little bit more, Ellen, please, clerk. Thank you very much. Thank you. City Council Direct the General Manager of Transportation Services to report to the local council's office if the conditions are not met and authorize the General Manager of Transportation Services to revoke the permit if the conditions approved by City Council are not met. Thank you. No taking the motion and taking the motion and the item together. All those in favor, opposed, carried. I think I'd like to record a vote on that, Chair. Oh, okay. I want staff to know they've got to stop. These guys have to stop. Can't get it done. If you can't get it done well. Okay, Councilor Fletcher. Good. Thank uh, you so, so much, Chair. You're quite welcome. So, if I could have the clerk call the roll. Thank you. A uh, vote on motion one by Councillor Fletcher. Um, if you would just indicate um, in the affirm uh, your your vote, um, Councillor Bailao. In favor. Councillor Bradford. In favor. Councillor Cressy. In favor. Councillor Fletcher. In favor. Councillor Matlow. In favor. Councillor Perks. Favor. And Councillor Wong Tam. 
In favor. The motion is adopted. Thank you very much. Thank you, colleagues. Item GE31.56, Accessible Parking Space, Coburn Avenue, non-delegated, Councillor Bradford. Thanks very much. I'd like to move the staff recommendations, please. Okay. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Item TE31.57, Accessible Parking Spaces, February 2022, delegated. Uh, Councillor Bradford. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I'd like to move the staff recommendations, please. All those in favor? Opposed, if any, that carries. Item TE31.58, Geary Avenue Mobility and Public Realm Strategy Update. Councillor Bailao. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to move staff recommendations. Okay. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Item TE31.59, car share vehicle parking areas, various locations. Councillor Cressy. I'll move the staff recommendations. All those in favor? Opposed? That carries as well. Item TE31.60, pay and display parking. Lansdowne Avenue, Councillor Bailao. Staff recommendations. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE 31.61, parking amendments, Coburn Avenue, Councillor Fletcher. Gosburn Avenue, Mr. Chair. Sorry. For the record. I think Coburn's in your ward, but spelled out there, uh, I'd like to move this. This is from a great resident. You know, uh, sight lines are so important, and this is to improve the sight lines on Cosburn and apartment neighborhood. Lots of big buildings, lots of people going out of, of underground garages. So I'd like to move this here today. Thank you. All right. Uh, on the other yeah, recommendations, yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Item TE31.62. Right turn on red prohibition, Davenport Road and Osler Street. Councillor Bailao. Move staff recommendations. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Item TE31.63. Parking amendments, Unity Road. Councillor Fletcher. Thank you. I'd like to move this. Uh, Metrolinx is using this whole little neighborhood to go and get to the tracks. And this, along with some other issues, are uh, I'm asking staff to please make that safer. A lot of trucks going around. So uh, lots of pedestrians, people walking. Let's have pedestrian safety and road safety. Well, Metrolinx is um, busy. And I don't know if they have to have Enterprise Canada system in this neighborhood to let everybody know how they're doing such a great job, but um, we'll do a better job. Thank you. Okay. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE 31.64, additional traffic calming, Milverton Boulevard, Councillor Fletcher. This too, and I just want to thank staff because they, um, citizens wanted, residents wanted another speed hump and it was too close so staff came up with putting a little island and this will be great so just thank you very much transportation staff and with that i'll move it thank you okay all those in favor opposed carried item te 31.65 use of nathan phillips square for various events from april 1st to july 31st 2022 councillor cressy i'll move the staff recommendations those in favor opposed carry item 
Item TE31.66, Appointments to the Central Eglinton Community Center Board of Management. Councillor Mappo. I support the recommendations. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE31.67, Stella Mars Catholic School Pickup Drop-Off Zone. Councillor Bailao. Move recommendations in the letter. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE31.68, turn prohibitions, buses accepted, Bloor Street West and Dufferin Street. Councillor Bailao. Move recommendations in the letter. All those in favor, opposed, <coughs> carried. Item TE31.69, parking amendment, Huron Street, south of Bloor Street West. Is Councillor Layton with us yet? Hi there, Mr. Chair. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I will. I will move the recommendations in the letter. Very good. Okay. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Item TE thirty one point seven zero. Parking amendments, Shaw Street. Councillor Layton. I will move the recommendations. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE 31.71, parking amendments, road in place. Councillor Lee. I will move the recommendations. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE 31.72, installing bollards on exchange lane. Councillor Wong Tam. Uh, yes, thank you. I'd like to move the recommendations contained in my letter. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE 31.73, improving pedestrian safety at Front Street and Frederick Street. Councillor Wong Tam. Uh, yes, thank you. I'd like to uh, move an amendment to the recommendations contained in the letter. And Ellen can put that onto the screen. Thank you. Uh, the, it's just a further um, request to staff on top of the recommendations and letter that, that transportation staff review the capital their capital plan and to report back in the fourth quarter of this year on the feasibility of expanding uh, improving pedestrian safety on Front Street uh, as well as Frederick by accelerating the widening of sidewalks and the removal of boulevard parking. Uh, we're trying to make this uh, intersection safer. Uh, so obviously the installation of pedestrian uh, lights is one thing, but if there's an opportunity to bump out those sidewalks, uh, we would like to do that. And we're happy uh, to pay for it. Uh, uh, Councillor, um, there, there is no business meeting of community council scheduled for Q4 of 22. I believe no, the last yeah. one is in July. Um, I would like to make the request for July. I think we just wanted to give staff more time. Um, yeah. But uh, why don't I hold that down and I'll consult with transportation staff on the appropriate date for the report back. We just don't want to miss a construction cycle. Um, but uh, it's unlikely that even if we can get it approved in July, they can begin work this summer. Uh, but I'll hold that down. So we'll hold item 73. Will you yeah. work with staff on that? Okay. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Uh, item TE 31.74, decreasing the speed limit on Dermot Place to 30 kilometers an hour. Councillor Wong Pan. Uh, yes, thank you. I'd like to move recommendations that contain in my letter. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE 31.75, endorsement of events for liquor licensing purposes. Uh, Councillor Bala let you do the party clause um approve recommendations all those in favor opposed carried uh oh i've lost an item sorry oh yes okay now uh before i introduce new business i'm going to return to a couple of items that were held well, we waited for Councillor Layton. I'll go first to item 31.33.
Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I'll just sec we have to read read the title of it. Give me one sec. Sorry, sorry. I'm working off three devices and and a big fat notepad today. So. Uh. Five nine five Bay Street and three hundred six Young Street official plan and zoning bylaw amendment application preliminary report. Councillor Lake. Yes, I'll move the staff recommendation. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Item T E thirty one point three four three two zero three two eight and three three two Blue Street West zoning bylaw amendment application preliminary report. Councillor Layton. I will move the staff recommendations. All those in favor, opposed, carried. <laughs> hmm. Item TE 31.35, 69 Yorkville Avenue, official plan amendment and zoning amendment application preliminary report. Councillor Layton. And again, I would like to move the staff recommendations. Thank you. Okay. All those in favor, opposed, carried. All righty then. Now we will go to item, I believe it's yeah i need a motion to introduce items 76 through 97 97 oh, guys chair happy to do that thank you councillor fletcher okay let's get there Item TE 31.76, Amendments to Existing Parking Regulation on Parkdale Road at Glendale Avenue. I will move the contents of my letter. All those in favor? Opposed? Carry. Item TE 31.77, Parking Amendments on Triller Avenue between, between Queen Street West and King Street West. I will move the recommendations in my letter. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Item TE 31.78, request to reopen item 27.38, uh, parking machines, various streets intersecting Bloor Street West. I will move the recommendations in my letter to uh, first reopen the item. All those in favor, opposed, carried. And secondly, to amend attachment two, as described in my letter, and attempt uh, attachment three as described in my letter. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE 31.79, Shaw Street, Community Safety Zone, Councillor Cressy. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'd like to move the recommendations in my letter. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE 31.80, implementation of a, perm, a permit parking on Kensington Avenue between Baldwin Street and St. Andrews Street. Councillor Layton. I'll, I'll move the recommendation to the button. All those in favor, opposed, carry. Item TE 31.81, implementation of turn restrictions at Oriel Parkway and Imperial Street on a pilot basis. Councillor Matlow. I move the recommendation in the letter. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE 31.82, authorize the installation of speed humps on Gormley Avenue between Oriel Parkway and Lachelle Boulevard. Councillor Matlow. I move the recommendation. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE 31.83, installation of stop controls at two Y-like intersections at Old Forest Hill Road and Russell Hill Road. Know them well. Councillor Matlow. I, I move the recommendation. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE 31.84 prohibition prohibit stopping on the west side of Red Path Avenue, immediately south of Eglinton Avenue East. Councillor Matlow. I move that too. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE 31.85. Updating signage to ensure pedestrian and public safety 
on Reverend Porter Lane, Councillor Wong Tan. Uh, thank you. I move the recommendations. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Item TE 31.86, response to TE 30.39, 49 Felsted Avenue, zoning matter. Councillor Fletcher. Yes, Mr. Chair, I'd like to hold this and I'm going to have to go, go questions of staff. Complicated, it's been here before. and probably go in camera for that later on. Thank you. Okay, uh, Councillor Fletcher. Um, uh with your concurrence what i'd like to suggest uh given how many items we have i i don't have a clear idea of when would be the best time to go on camera can we just put a hold on that and assess at which time when would be no problem whatever you need okay thank you Item TE31.87, no parking signs, 116 Greenwood Avenue, Councillor Fletcher. I would like to uh, approve, our Councillor, to approve the recommendation in the letter. Thank you. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Look, everything's beeping at me. Item TE31.88, recipient of the 2022 Agnes McPhail Award. This is one of those ones where I really hate that we're not meeting together and can't do a presentation. Uh, Councillor Fletcher and Bradford, who wants to? Councillor Fletcher. Yes, I have that to move. Uh, it's really, I, is this a public name? No, I just need to ask the clerk. When we it's, do it's public on the, on the record? It's public on the record. So this is a fantastic selection. Uh, Cam, who for 25 years has run the Christmas dinner for seniors in East York to make sure seniors get a, uh, get a hot meal, hot turkey meal. And uh, I'm going to move to approve, but I do have some questions of staff, just uh, asked them earlier. So just hold that for now. I'm very we'll excited with the recommendation. From okay. Somebody. Thank you. Uh, I was going to ask Councillor Bradford if he had any remarks, but perhaps we can get to those when, because we have when we, yeah. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Item TE31.89, TTC exemption to turn prohibition, Kingston Road and Glen Manor Drive. Councillor Bradford. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I'd like to move the recommendations in my letter. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE31.90, authorize the installation of an all-way stop control at Chaplin Crescent and Russell Hill Road. Councillor Matlow. I move the recommendation. Okay, all those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE31.91, improving the public realm and road safety on Richmond Street and Adelaide Street. Uh, Councillor Wong Tam. Uh, yes, thank you. This is a joint letter uh, submission from Councillor Cressy and myself. Uh, we're looking to um, improve the safety uh, uh, on Richmond and Adlai uh, to take a look at opportunities for public realm investments uh, where we can and to revisit the, uh, the operations of the street, including potentially uh, two-way operations. Uh, there's been a number of high-profile uh, collisions, uh, incidents on, the, on, the, on that street. Uh, you may have heard about the uh, uh, an incident where a car literally was torpedoed onto the sidewalk and injured seven individuals and killed uh, one young man. Uh, he'll never come back to us. Um, so if there is a way for us to ensure that Vision Zero, the spirit of Vision Zero and the principles of Vision Zero are incorporated, uh, this is exactly what we need to do. Um, and so thank you very much. I'm not sure if Councillor Cressy wants to speak to it, um, but uh, this is a very important initiative for us. Councillor Cressy? I would just like to echo uh, Councillor Wong Tam's comments here. Um, Adelaide and Richmond were converted to one-way streets in 1958, 64 years ago. And in the context of um, pedestrian safety, improved public realm, half ATO, uh, and broader uh, upgrades for, for uh, transit and mode movement, uh, we think uh, a review uh, is warranted and necessary, and I, and I look forward to uh, 
to participating in this and the details coming back. And uh, I would just add, uh, Councillor Casey, you're absolutely right, but uh, there's also going to be uh, extensive consultation with stakeholder in the community. Uh, so we'll look forward to that conversation uh, when it's appropriate. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All those in favor, opposed, carried. And if I could remind members to turn their microphones off. There we go. Okay. Um, Item TE 31.92, road alteration at 154 through 158 Front Street East. Oh, if I lost, was that not right? Councillor Wong Tam? Uh, yes, thank you very much. I do have uh, recommendations in the letter that I would like to uh, move. Uh, and the recommendations, um, oops, sorry, I'm just. Uh, Chair, you're not, your it's okay, you're the only, uh, my, my screen also just did a little jump. Um, the recommendations are to uh, direct city staff, transportation staff to review the revised drawing uh, for this particular application that's sitting at 154 to 158, uh, to try to find ways to ensure that the road alterations on the north side of Front Street between Frederick as well as Sherburn uh, could potentially result in a better road design. Uh, and of course, the principles of Vision Zero are once again at play. We want to ensure uh, and expand, improve pedestrian cycling safety wherever we can. Uh, we will also be authorizing a temporary lane closure on the north side of Front Street between Frederick and Sherbert Street for at least 45 days to construct the proposed uh, road alterations. Uh, this is a very important initiative uh, for the uh, for the St. Lawrence Market BIA. Uh, they have been a huge proponent and champion of tying development to public realm improvements so that you can uh, you can dig once and repair once as opposed to having two separate contractors come in and tearing up the road twice. Uh, it is uh, critically important that we overlay Vision Zero road safety components on top of public realm improvements and on top of what development uh, uh, is already happening in the neighborhood. Uh, it's a lot of coordination, a lot of communication. Sometimes those schedules don't line up. But we're doing everything we can through a lot of hard work. And I must say, it's a lot of hard work to try to pull all the different parties together and to get transportation staff to work with us uh, just because they're so uh, stretched. Um, a lot of flexibility has to come into play from the different stakeholders. Um, and it just means that everyone's got to have to give us a little bit in order for us to make it move in the same direction at the same time. Uh, so I'm hoping that we can do that uh, for this uh, for this uh, portion of, of Front Street, it's important to us, and I want to thank the BIA for their um, incredible and passionate advocacy uh, to get the city to do more and better and faster. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Uh, TE 31.93, Construction Management Working Groups in Toronto Centre, starting with West Donlands, Councillor Wong Tam. Um, thank you very much, uh, Chair. I'm going to withdraw this item, um, and uh, and we're going to have a conversation at some point, and I think it's going to be our next meeting. Uh, what I really want to do is uh, is work with uh, with the transportation staff, to be quite honest, uh, to to try to address the the constant cycle of construction that seems to be never ending uh, in many pockets of our neighborhoods, especially in the downtown. So. Um, I, I won't speak much more to that because we're going to have an opportunity in our next TYCC meeting, uh, but we've got to make these construction management traffic uh, management working groups uh, much more effective. Thank you very much. Okay, so on the motion to withdraw, all those in favor, opposed, carry. Item TE 31.94, making Main Street safer, speed limit reduction and road reclassification. Councillor Bradford. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'd like to move the recommendations in my letter, please. Okay. I'm just going to make a little note in my own personal files about load reclassification. Good one. Um, okay. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Item TE 31.95, road safety improvements around Secord Elementary School, Councillor Bradford. 
Thanks very much, Mr. Chair. I'd like to move the recommendations in my letter, please. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE 31.95. Uh, oh, wait, did I just do 95? Yeah, I just did 95. 96. Uh, speed bump installation on Cosmos Nature Lane. Councillor Bailao. Proof recommendations in the letter. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE 31.97, speed hump installation at Stonehouse Crescent. Councillor Bailao. Give uh, proof recommendations in the letter. All those in favor, opposed, carried. That is the list of added business that I have. Mr. Chair, so, I'll be adding a number, another issue on here for a Dongland second exit where we have a very dangerous okay. situation at Wilkinson School. So my staff are sending that in to the clerk. I'm sure she'll advise you when you have it and that can come later today. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. And again, a reminder to all members of council um, or the community council, the clerk and I are not physically in the same location today, so everything takes just that much longer. Please be patient with us. We're very patient. Please be patient with us. Thanks. Oh, absolutely. Um, all right. That takes us to item TE 31.1, naming of an existing public lane north of Dundas Street West, extending between Dovercourt Road and Cool Mine Road. Uh, public notice has been given on this statutory item. I have no deputants listed. Councillor Bailao. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Chair. Moves uh, staff recommendations. Want to thank everybody in the community that joined the family to um, get the petition, get this uh, recognition done to a community member and uh, a member of uh, the BIA. Uh, for a long time at uh, Little Portugal. Okay, all those in favor, opposed, carried. Next is item TE 31.2, naming of an existing public lane north of Gerard Street East, extending easterly from Leslie Street. Public notice has been given. I have no deputants listed. Councillor Fletcher. Yes, I'm very pleased to move this name, Leslie Ridge Lane. Of course, this whole area is the old shoreline, Lake Iroquois shoreline. And this is um, a laneway home is built here. And so they're now naming the lane. So there's an address. So there you go. Move this with great pleasure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All those in favor, opposed, yes. carried. To the chair. This yes. is the host, if I may interrupt for a moment. We have a call in user who uh, we don't have a name for. Uh, I'd like to pause the meeting right now to identify them in case they are a registered speaker on an item. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you. This is the host to call in user 647461. We are unmuting your line. If you could let us know if you are a registered speaker on an item, please. Uh, no, I'm, uh, I'm city staff uh, for MLS. Open Understood. Thank you. This is the house turning it over to the chair. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our next item is TE 31.3, permanent closure of a stratified parcel of public lane located to the west of 375 Queen Street West. Public notice has been given. I have no deputants listed and I'm intensely curious. Councillor Cressy. I will move the staff recommendations. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Uh, and Councillor, can you also move 3A, the supplementary? Uh, yes, I can, sorry. And I will move the recommendations in the supplementary 3A. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE 31.4. 340 to 376 R Dufferin Street and 2 Melbourne Avenue official plan amendment and zoning bylaw amendment application final report. I do have a deputant on this one. One moment. Christina Glass. 
Christina, are you with us? Good morning and thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is Christina Glass. I'm the manager of development for Hallmark, the owner uh, and applicant for this site. I just wanted to note uh, that we're very thankful to staff through this process and working to uh, determine an appropriate range of uses for the site. I'm available to respond to any questions uh, that you or other members may have regarding uh, the applicant, uh, the application for ownership. Thank you. Okay. Uh, are there any questions of the deputy? Seeing none. Uh, thank you, Christina. Um, next, I have listed Michael Bissett of Bousfields. Michael, are you with us? To the chair, Michael is present. Uh, we had unmuted him, but it looks like he muted himself. One moment, please. Michael Bissett, we are unmuting your line now. Apologies. <laughs> It's Mike Bissett here. Um, I'm a planner for uh, the applicant. I, uh, again, just wanted to thank staff as well, and I'm here to answer any questions. I don't think uh, I need to uh, belabor it any further than that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions for the deputy? Seeing none, Mike, thank you for making yourself available today. Um, that concludes the list of deputants I have on this item. Uh, so I will move the staff recommendations. All those in favor, opposed, if any, that carries. Item TE 31.5, 72 Perth Avenue, zoning amendment application, final report. Uh, notice has been given. I do not have any deputants listed. Councillor Bailao. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move staff recommendations and thank everybody involved. Um, just want to um, let the committee know that even though the report doesn't talk about it, because this building was under 10,000 square meters and was not, um, it didn't qualify for Section 37, this is actually uh, the first building uh, that will have affordable housing units as part of the agreement that Castle Point and Wood Green. Uh, a sign so wood green will be operating between 10 and 15 percent of these units uh in this um in in this building uh, not as part of any section 37 but because um the developer uh committed to do this and signed this agreement with a nonprofit. it's great to see these kinds of initiatives coming uh from the initiative of the development uh and recognizing the importance of providing uh, mixed communities, affordable housing as they develop in our communities without even having to have, you know, bylaws, but actually coming and working with the community and with the nonprofit sector and providing uh, what it's going to be a rental building with um, uh, close to 15% of the units um, managed uh, by Wood Green and as affordable housing. So very happy to see that happening. Looking forward to having many, many in the industry to do these kinds of, uh, of projects. All right. I just have a question for the deputy mayor, please. Uh, okay. This was a voluntary situation from the developer. And just remind me, how big of a development is this? How many units are there all together? It's Rental. actually not a big development. I think it's uh, just uh, just uh, uh, over eighty something units. It's it's a small development. They signed an agreement with Wood Green to have uh, a few hundred units over the next few years. So they're going to be producing units for wood grain uh, as affordable housing in different buildings. This is the first one that uh, that they're they're coming through. Um, and the report doesn't talk about it because the city didn't secure it as a section 37 or as inclusionary zoning or anything. It was the initiative of these organizations. And, and I think both of them, Wood Green has been doing a great work of actually working with the industry to deliver these units. Um, and we see it here in, in a small rental development, um, but uh, you know, the, these number of units will have a great impact in the community, a community that is undergoing a great amount of pressure um very close to transit so affordable housing make, makes so much sense so it's really good to see uh this kind of partnership coming through and don't just remind me how much was secured there's 80 units and the percentage it, it's between, 
they they've agreed that is going to be between 10 and 15 percent they're really targeting that 15 percent uh, we're just fine-tuning something with metro links that is going to impact the design of the unit so that's why we don't have uh, a final number but that's that's the number they're targeting at that's very exciting congratulations on that one that we should have more It'd be great to have more of that. It, it's a great example of, of like partnerships between industry and the nonprofit and i think that uh, as a city um, we need to emphasize and promote this because it'd be great to see more uh, coming through with this kind of, uh, of partnerships. Great, thank you. Okay. Um, Any other questions? Sorry to interrupt uh, to the chair. Um, we have two motions on this item for Councillor Bylaw prepared. That's, uh I, that's right. Sorry, oh, staff. Oh, Councillor Bylaw. I know it was last minute. Staff had asked me to move uh, some uh, amendments. So if I could, <laughs> uh, well, one is an amendment. The other one is with related to parking. It's the community that that had asked. Um, so if I could have the motions and have your support for this, we can just have those up for a moment. Thank you. Okay, and the other one, there were two or is that both? It, there were two. I'm, I'm sorry, have I misunderstood? Are we still waiting for another one to be posted? Just give us a moment, please. Yeah, okay, no problem, no problem. I got lost, not you. Okay, very good. Uh, so uh, let's take those two amendments and the item together. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. All right. Next is 31.6. Uh, 287 Davenport Road and 141, 143, and 145 Bedford Road. Rental housing demolition application final report. Count uh, notice has been given. I have no deputants listed. Councillor Lake. Yes, thank you very much. I'll move the staff recommendations. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE31. Point seven ninety five through one three one and one five five Beloyal Street rental housing demolition application final report. I have a deputant listed, Andrew Palumbo. Andrew, are you with us? Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of council. Welcome, Andrew. You'll have five minutes to address the committee. You can begin when you're ready. Very. Uh, simply put, uh, just um, here today to answer any questions. Um, I, I will note that uh, the owner is amply in support of the staff recommendations and just say I'm happy to answer any questions. I'm here as the planner representing the applicant. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for Andrew? I don't see any. Andrew, thank you for making yourself available to us today. Yeah. Okay, that completes the list of deputants. So, uh, are there any questions of staff? I don't see any. Um, Councillor Matlow. I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. Would you mind just reminding me which is the this item? This is uh, uh, 95 to 133 and 155 Beloyal Street, the rental housing demolition application. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, so I, I move the staff recommendations. All those in favor? Opposed, if any, that carries. Item TE 31.8. 2128 Young Street, zoning amendment application, final report. Uh, notice has been given. I do not have any documents listed on this item. Councillor Matlow. Move the recommendations. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE 31.9, 
252 Parliament Street, Zoning Bylaw Amendment Application, Final Report. Uh, I have a deputant listed, Caitlin Allen. Caitlin, are you with us? Morning, uh, Mr. Chair and members of Community Council. I'm Caitlin Allen from Bowsfield, and we're the planning consultant for Core Development Group with regards to their, their property at 252 Parliament. Um, which is just on the west side of Parliament and east side of Poulet. Um, so really, I, I want to use the time today to express our thanks and appreciation for all of the work that staff have put into this application, as well as the input of the community members who have been involved in the process. Um, the owners worked uh, quite closely with city staff, as well as the local community over the past 18 months, um, including both through formal and informal uh, engagement sessions, and we're really pleased to be arriving at this final report in support of uh, the proposal today. So, um, it is for a nine-story building, which includes an amenity level, uh, which uh, with at-grade retail and sixty-nine purpose-built rental building or rental unit. Sorry, um, the building conforms with the mixed-use areas designation that applies based on the downtown plan. Um, transitions down in height towards the neighborhoods to the west will contribute to the, the retail vitality of Parliament Street, which is identified as a priority retail street in the downtown plan, and contributes to uh, an improved public realm along Poulet. Um, and in terms of, you know, an overall uh, contribution, it does introduce new rental housing to the neighborhood with a really high ratio of indoor and outdoor amenities. So in summary, we just want to express our thanks again and advise that we're in support of the findings of the final staff report and respectfully request you adopt its recommendations. And I'm here to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Are there any questions for Caitlin? Seeing none, Caitlin, thank you very much for uh, making yourself available to us today. Uh, that concludes the list of deputations. Uh, are there any questions of staff? Seeing none, Councillor Wong Tam. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. I'd like to move the recommendations in the staff report uh, to thank them for their work uh, in reviewing the application. Uh, we don't oftentimes see nine-story uh, applications come through our through our wards, so and when we do get one, uh, oftentimes uh, we, we give it the same consideration as we would uh, for a tall building. Um, but I was, I, I must say that the applicant uh, was very forthcoming when we asked them to go and engage and speak with the neighborhood. They did so quite willingly uh, and they went back over and over again to make sure that the community residents uh, was aware of their plans, especially as the, as the building was just shifting uh, ever so slightly. Uh, we also had a site plan working group uh, where the community was able to sort of directly meet with city planners, urban designers, and, uh, and the applicant to formally review uh, their submission for the site plan. Uh, again, the issue around beautiful streets, uh, safe streets came up, uh, and I think that uh, overall uh, the feedback loop was, was really great. So I want to thank the applicant for, for participating in that process because I think it really did help us move this application along quickly. I want to thank the staff for their timely review of this application, uh, and overall I would say uh, this is a good news story uh, for our community just across the street from Regent Park on Parliament and just south from Cabbage Town. So we welcome them to the neighborhood and I'll look forward uh, to, uh, uh, to the building being complete. And of course, welcoming our new neighbors. We would like to say thank you to everybody uh, for their participation and their active involvement. This was great. Okay, thank you. Any questions of the mover? Seeing none, anyone else wish to speak? Seeing none, all those in favor, opposed, carried. <clears throat> Item TE 31.10, 161 and 167 Parliament Street, 351, 363, 371 and 373 Queen Street East, and 80, 90, 92 and 94 Power Street, Rental Housing Demolition Application Final Report. I do have two deputants listed. First, uh, Caitlin Allen. Caitlin, welcome back. 
Hello again, Mr. Chair. So I'm Caitlin Allen of Housefields, but I am currently here for this item as the planning consultant to one properties with respect to their site. Um, and we also have a representative from one properties who was planning to um, also also speak. Um, we again are in support of uh, the final the recommendations of this report and want to thank staff for all of the work they have put into this. Um, this report comes from is further to an approval that's been granted in principle by the Ontario Land Tribunal um, based on a settlement endorsed by City Council for the redevelopment of this site, but it deals specifically with the eight rental replacement units and um, the, the details set out therein, uh, including with respect to um, securing the units at a similar size type and rent as what currently exists and um, the development of an acceptable tenant relocation and assistance plan. Um, and I will just flag, as the report does as well, that this includes an increased financial compensation um, as a rent gap payment to uh, support tenants that need to relocate offsite during construction and subsidize the difference in rents based on what they're currently paying versus the market rents in the area. So. We'll look forward to continuing to work with city staff to finalize the Section 111 agreement. But again, we uh, thank staff for their work on this report and um, respectfully request the adoption of its recommendations as well. So I'm here to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Caitlin. Are there any questions for Caitlin? Seeing none, uh, Caitlin, thank you for making yourself available and for your thoughts today. Uh, next, I have listed uh christina caligarakis christina are you with us hi hi thank you thank you mr chairman and good morning members of council um i also wanted to thank everyone uh for their work on this report i represent the ownership group at one properties and um i'm also available to answer any questions thank you thank you christina are there any questions Seeing none, Christina, thank you for making yourself available today. Thank you. Uh, that concludes the list of deputations on this item. Uh, are there any questions of staff? Seeing none, Councillor Wong Tan. Uh, yes, thank you. I'd like to just uh, begin by offering my thanks to staff for working with the uh, uh, with the applicant to arrive to this conclusion. This application at uh, at the corner of Parliament uh, and Queen. Uh, was uh, is, is almost a legacy project uh, from previous councillor uh, Pam McConnell. Obviously, it did go to the OLT as, the, as one of the deputants stated. Um, and this report is uh, I, what I would describe as a tidy up item, uh, just the final resolution on how to uh, ensure that the rental demolition takes place in a, in a, in a respectful manner um, and to make sure that the tenants, which is the most important thing, that the tenants are going to be protected and properly compensated uh, while the building is being built. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. Okay, any questions of the mover? Seeing none, uh, anyone else to speak? No, all those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE31.11-8397 River Street Avenue and 2 through 4 Labatt Avenue Rental Housing Demolition Application Final Report. Notice has been given on this item. I have no deputants listed. Are there any questions of staff? Seeing none, Councillor Uh Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to move the recommendations in the staff report. Again, I want to thank staff for. Uh, for their work in uh, ensuring that uh, there's a, a responsible plan in place to protect the uh, the housing uh, that we're losing temporarily while the, uh, the property is being uh, uh, rebuilt. Um, it is also important for me to note that this is a, this is a, by cause of another settlement uh, of an OLT appeal, uh, so it did not necessarily happen in the most amicable way. Although I think we're getting to a good outcome by way of this report. Um, and uh, and once again, uh, it really has everything to do with making sure that rental properties that are being demolished um, to make way for new development is that we've got to protect that stock and do everything we can to make it affordable 
bring it back in its original um, uh, specifications to the best of our ability and to hopefully um, welcome tenants back uh, if they choose to come back. Uh, it's uh, always very disruptive. There's only seven units here, but I know that staff worked really hard to, uh, to, to get this outcome. So thank you very much, everyone, including um, uh, the tenants and the, and the applicant. Okay, any questions of the mover? Seeing none, all the, uh, anyone else to speak on the item? Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed, if any, that uh, carries. Item TE 31.12, Dan 4th Avenue Planning Study Segment 2, Don Valley to Coxwell Avenue, City Initiated Official Plan Amendment and Urban Design Guidelines Final Report. I have two deputants listed. Uh, first, Wolfgang Kwan. Wolfgang, are you with us? This is the host to Wolfgang Kwan. Your line is currently unmuted. Oh, hey, sorry about that. I'm actually, um, I'm just here to uh, participate in here in the sites. I'm taking a class on city planning. I will say that I appreciate uh, all the work that's going into improving our city uh, being here today. Okay, uh, Wolfgang, believe it or not, I get to ask if any members have questions of you. No, seeing none, uh, good luck with your studies. Uh, I hope that this contributes to them in some positive way. Uh, the next deputant that I have listed is Mark Richardson. Mark, are you with us? Can you hear me okay? Yes, Mark, I can. Welcome. Thank you. I'm not going to take a lot of time today because I know you're busy. Um, I just wanted to uh, let you know we will be submitting a letter to full council in response to the draft urban design guidelines that were uh, provided by staff on the 14th. Uh, our housing now co.com volunteers have participated in all of the public consultations, both in person and WebEx events, over the last three years for the Danforth Avenue planning study segment two. Um, I think we all agree that with the existing TTC subway line and the new Ontario line interchange station planned at Payton Danforth, the City of Toronto is in the early stages of an excellent opportunity to encourage new smart transit oriented development with dedicated affordable housing capacity in an existing Toronto near core neighborhood along the Danforth. In particular, we'd like to thank the city planning staff for listening to the input of affordable housing advocates over the last three years, and finally relaxing some of the restrictive urban design guidelines that had existed in earlier drafts, in particular, the removal of the 45 degree angular plane requirement to allow for a more efficient and economical massing. Um, however, we're still concerned by the language on page 37 of the draft of the urban design guidelines, which states that city staff studied various mid-rise options along the Danforth, including a 12-story option, and determined that building higher than eight stories are inappropriate along the street. Based on our volunteers' assessment of the eight-story height limit in the draft urban design guidelines, we can't assess any single parcel along the Danforth between Don Valley and Coxwell that would have as of right permission to trigger the 100 unit, 8,000 square meters of residential gross floor area threshold required to create inclusionary zoning requirements inside the protected major transit station area at the Broadview Station, Chester Station, Pape Station, Donlands, Greenwood, or Coxwell. Um, you know, we've, we know developments that work for affordable housing. Deputy Mayor Bai Lau has 640 lands down, which is like a seven-story box building with seniors housing and long-term care. Um, Councillor Wong Tam has the new building proposed on Girard for the Young Street Mission. It's a 10-story box. We have to make these kinds of buildings as of right everywhere to make the affordable housing math work for not-for-profit developers. Nothing's going to change here today. I understand that. But there's an opportunity for you to start writing in to these, these secondary plans that some of these rules do not apply if you reach a threshold of 30% affordable housing units for a, a guaranteed period of 40 years. That is something that we would highly encourage you to change and bring into these plans over the next period. Thank you. 
Thank you. Are there any questions of Mr. Richardson? Yes, I'll just ask Mr. Richardson to um, your idea is to have just repeat that again for me, please. Essentially, the, the some of the requirements in the urban design guidelines do not apply if your project guarantees 30 percent, either 30 percent affordable units or 30 percent residential GFA for a minimum period of 40 years. It would allow not-for-profits to build the kinds of buildings that they are now building at the Young Street Mission site or at Councillor Bailayo's 640 Lansdowne site. Right, so that's 30% affordable and... Um, For 40 years, so gar guaranteed period of minimum of 40 years of affordability on private land. If you've got public land, turn it into a housing now site. Well. It might not that be that easy if they're smaller. Yeah. Housing yeah. now is actually for big sites. It's public, but we can make things happen with private public lands, as you well know, Don Somerville and other places. Thank you. Um, so that's a good idea, and I'll ask staff to get back to us on that. The um, MTSAs are all along there, and you're recognizing, of course, that they'll they'll all be in play as MTSAs, right? Correct, but unless we reach that 100-unit threshold or 8,000 square meters threshold, then IZ doesn't kick in. Uh, that's right. So there's also a few other ways to do that as well, um, which is like 838 Broadview, where the city has an official plan amendment to add 16 units, and that's also another option. Would you not agree with that? It's an option, but it's an incredibly inefficient option that takes a long time to process where making these things open and transparent on the front end within the secondary plans would mean that it wouldn't have to be a site by site haggle. I'm just not sure why you think that's inefficient and slow. It goes pretty quickly when you do it. We've been talking about that site at 838 Broadview for a decade. We've well, been that's talking not the about. Problem. I just, been, you, you must be aware the problem had to do with the actual. Uh, financial transactions between the TPA and the uh, and the uh, owner, other owners, and legacy from another councillor. Correct. Ge Let's, correct. Ge yeah, generally, we would like these processes to be faster. All of us would, and more everybody. transparent. Great. Appreciate you coming today and your ideas. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I have a, a question, uh, Mark. I just want to make sure I understand uh, what you're saying very clearly. Uh, so you are saying if we get certain affordable housing uh, conditions met, we should have different design standards. Correct. So we should have different design standards for people based on their income. No, we should have different design standards for not-for-profit operators who are working in a, a non-profit model. It's not, you know, oh, how so, you decide oh, to assign okay. them. Okay, so, so to understand then that uh, we should have different design standards based on whether something is privately owned or socially owned. I wouldn't say socially owned. I'd say not for profit because there are not for profit operators. I'm not talking about TCHC housing, for example. Okay, so you are saying we should have different design standards if something is privately owned or owned by a not for profit. Correct. We already do that to a degree because we have to give not-for-profit operators a lot of variances against the design standards in order to make their projects work. Well, I actually don't agree with your assertion, but anyway, so so people who live in not-for-profit housing should live in areas that do not meet the same design standard as people who live in privately owned housing. My preference would be that these urban design standards didn't exist to a degree in the first place, and we allowed more efficient buildings. But if we are trying to create affordable housing units, we need to create them in a model that is supportable by not-for-profit operators and all the various funding agencies that are available. So your preference is that we had different design standards irrespective of who the ownership model is, but you're saying since you can't get that, we should say that people who live in not-for-profit housing live in housing that doesn't meet the same design standard as people who live in private housing, correct? Exterior design standard. I understand you, that, you. that uh, but if you could answer my question. Yes, we have a different design standard in order to make the financing of affordable housing projects work 
to create affordable housing units, to create family size units. I'm not asking units. about whether or not the, the pro forma works. I'm asking a specific question about the lives of the people who move into various forms of housing. Since you cannot or have not succeeded in getting design standards changed generally, you are advocating that people who live in not for profit housing live in areas where the urban design standards are not as good as the ones for people who live in private housing. That's your assertion, correct? My assertion is that we need to create pro formas that do work even for not-for-profits. This is the only way some of these pro formas work. The design standards are different. The design standards, when we were building St. Lawrence, I couldn't rebuild a St. Lawrence building today because of the urban design standards. That is a social good neighborhood. Setbacks, angular planes are highly restrictive and they kill not-for-profit affordable housing developments. Thankfully, we've got some flexibility here that now makes them better. But it, 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 your choice is not some units and urban design guidelines. In, in some cases, urban design guides jeopardize the not-for-profit operator. And the building just doesn't happen. Do you want units or do you not want units, counselor? Is kind of my question. Okay. Uh, thank you for answering our questions here today. You're welcome, are as there, always. Are there any other questions uh, for Mark? Councillor Bylaw. Mark, I just want to make sure I understood you correctly. What you're saying is in order for affordable housing to happen, and particularly affordable housing done by the nonprofits, the math also has to work, like in every project, correct? Correct. And for nonprofits, the math is even more challenging, correct? Correct. And what you're saying is what makes the, the, the guidelines have an impact on math, because the setbacks, you're not able to, the floor plans that you have, the size of the units that you have, the uh, uh, efficiency of the building, all that has an impact on the map. That's what you're saying, correct? Correct. And what you're saying is taking, if, if you really want to support these nonprofits to create more affordable housing, you need to be more flexible on these guidelines. They need to be treated as guidelines and not rules. I think at 838 Broadview, for example, we went through the guidelines that were in the Broadview secondary plan in order to make the math work. You're only generating 16 units of affordable there. Yeah. So for uh, example, you're as, building at Lansdowne, right? Yeah. I was going to talk about the building on Lansdowne. So that one is a long-term care home that has very specific floor plans for from the province. It's legislated, a lot of those things. So if we were to apply the guidelines in there, it would actually mean long-term care or nothing because we would never be able to build 256 units of long-term care using the guidelines right Correct. And, there's, and there's like two floors of affordable seniors housing in that building you're building a seven-story box yeah ask staff could i build 640 lands downs built form anywhere between coxwell and the dvp along the grand forth as of right the answer as we read these materials that only came out two days ago the answer is no. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Mark? Right. Councilor Ryder. Thanks very much. Thanks for the deputation, uh, Mark. Would it be fair to suggest, or are you suggesting that some of the urban design guidelines that we have in place along our avenues in different parts of the city uh, impact? the unit count on projects yes i mean look at what's happening on your housing now site at queen and coxwell we're trying to apply urban design guidelines there the beach bible as it is called by some people and it's created a highly conflictual problem um in trying to generate the units we need you want green buildings you want family size units um, in our materials, we're going to 
submit a building that, that's being built in Chicago. It's a gorgeous looking building, but it's a 10 story box. And it gives you all the things you say you want in affordable housing in the city. So I asked the question just about unit count more broadly, but if, and, and, and you indicated that yes, more broadly, our urban design counts will change the yields on these projects. Of course, if you have a wedding cake style, if you have the angular setback, uh, angular plane and, and stepping backwards on a affordable housing project, would it be fair to say then that some of these guidelines prevent us having a higher unit count of affordable units on these projects? If we were to adhere letter of the law uh, as of right um, interpretation of, of the zoning and the guidelines on affordable housing projects? Yes, because, you know, that step back restricts your floor plate as you move up. And as the floor plate gets smaller, your cost gets higher. And you also literally lose the square footage that you need for family size units and accessible units. Um, you know, we've, we've seen this on a number of housing now sites. So let me ask you this in terms of practicality, city planning and the folks that are reviewing these applications, they are trying to review and balance a number of, you know, dozens of commenting partners, uh, numerous policies, guidelines. And would it be fair to say that in some instances, those policies, those guidelines are actually competing against each other? Yes, 100%. And I'd say, particularly, you know, Councillor Perk's comment about the, the, I don't, I, he didn't care about the pro forma. You know, we have to care about pro forma because the pro forma is what makes a project work or not work. It's a yes or no, it's not a, a maybe. So without getting into those comments, but yeah. if the objective is, if the overall objective, overarching objective, if we are prioritizing delivering maximum yield of affordable units, recognizing that your context and comments were all taken in the you know, not-for-profit affordable unit context of development, if we're prioritizing maximum yield of affordable units, would that then behoove us or require us to look at some of these guidelines and perhaps have a different approach on maximum yield affordable housing sites in the not-for-profit sector? Is that what you're suggesting? Yes. The, the, if we're putting our thumb on the scale in either way, the choice between the urban design guidelines or an extra 25 affordable housing units or a shadow study or 25 affordable housing units, I'm always going to say pick the 25 extra affordable housing units. And just lastly, in a world where we could have it all, we wouldn't have to make those compromises. But in the world that we live in and the housing crisis that we're facing and our collective prioritization of affordable units, maximum yield affordable units, something has to give. And you would suggest that it's a bit of a compromise on some of those guidelines on not profit affordable housing sites. Correct. We are already doing on the housing now sites for example and on other affordable housing sites like the young street mission site on gerard understood okay thanks for the application thanks for answering the questions all right that was a pile of fun um thanks mark as always uh you certainly uh, get us all stimulated in thinking um those are the only documents that i have listed on the item are there any questions of staff yes i'll, I'll ask that question to staff. Yeah. Uh, I'll ask that question to staff about that Mr. Richardson asked, suggested, that could we build the 640 Lansdowne on the Danforth as an as of right building currently within these design guidelines? For the chair, um, 640 Lansdowne is. Oh, it's hard to hear you. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes, very well now. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, through the chair, 640 Lansdowne is a very different circumstance. It's a very large site. Um, it's not a main street like Danforth Avenue, so it's, it is a very different circumstance, and we're working with that. Um, it's also city-owned, so we're working in that context. Um, you know, we haven't done a test to see if you could actually, you know, lift that building onto the Danforth. Um, However, we have looked to, to speak to the issue of flexibility. We very specifically looked at flexibility on Danforth and efficient floor plates, which are important. And that's the reason why we've allowed for uh, deeper floor plates, um, a reduced angular plane towards the neighborhoods and transition into the neighborhoods um, onto the neighborhood designated lands to allow 
uh, deeper transition, deeper buildings, and more height, um, including you know, walk-up apartment buildings into the neighborhood designated lands uh, that flank both the north and south sides of Danforth. And to get to the 100 units, uh, what would site size, et cetera, et cetera, are there many sites, and I know you've looked at all of them, many sites that would be able to accommodate that? So to so to get to the 100 units, um, you know, many of the lots on Danforth are very shallow. We, you know, one of the reasons we're looking for adding depth um, and, and quite small. So you would have to um, execute a land assembly to be able to get a larger site, which has happened in many instances. We have taken a look at what's happened um, on segment one, which was approved a few years ago. And we have a, a number of buildings um, that have achieved over 100 units, even though those ones are all adhering strictly to the mid-rise angular plane. And do we any have, of them have, sorry to interrupt, do any of them have affordable in them? Um, I don't have the exact numbers on affordable, but what they, and they all predate inclusionary zoning. So what it does mean though, that these examples on the Danforth and also on many other avenues in, in Toronto, um, we have many opportunities to surpass that 100 unit threshold, in which case we could apply inclusionary zoning for new buildings coming in on this part of the Danforth and, and other, other avenues in the city. And when we started the study, we hadn't yet been at these studies for quite a while and the pandemic did get in the way. Uh, thanks to the staff for powering through that and for all our Zoom meetings or WebEx meetings. But we had now have inclusionary zoning, which we did not have at the beginning of the study, right? That's correct. And because, as you mentioned, Councillor Fletcher, um, the entire Danforth is within MTSA uh, uh, designations, they will all, all the sites will be subject to inclusion zoning. Even uh, ones that aren't right at the station. So the whole segment will be. Maybe we need to have another little look at this. The other thing is just in the point of the urban design guidelines, there are currently a number of social housing providers on the Danforth. In particular, uh, there's Mainstay and there's uh, Houselink are there. Uh, been prevented from adding floors um, just because of our urban design guidelines. and. I think I'm going to ask you to have another look at that one site vis-a-vis -vis the vis-a-vis -vis the child care center and any of the restrictions around building anything because the TTC yards and the subways that we all enjoy all leave from under the city's daycare. So there will never be anything built there. Uh, given those types of circumstances, is it not possible to not have uh, the relationship to have a different relationship with the daycare one story and a next door neighbor so so we're certainly willing to look at this and and you know we've proven as we've gone through this that there isn't a one size fits all for all sites um so we definitely will look at it and we have um looked at some flexibility on different sites you know whether it's a market development or affordable um development and the urban design guidelines are guidelines. You know, in this case, they are very, very closely aligned with these site and area specific policies because they were developed together. Um, however, we're certainly willing to look at, at individual sites um, to see if, if we can incorporate additional flexibility. And there are a number of churches on the Danforth, which um, of heritage, heritage uh, designations or heritage themselves. But for churches, is there some way to ensure that they're not just all going as they, they have enjoyed a tax exempt status, I understand, for 100 and more years, probably. Yes, so I will um, I will let my heritage colleagues add to that. A number of the churches on Danforth are landmark buildings. You know, they're very important to uh, to the neighborhood. Um, but we have also had a number of instances uh, where we've been able to add community use or housing or done in kind of an adaptive reuse of churches so absolutely flexible but mary mcdonald is on no, I'm, I, I'm just asking about the affordable segment we've allowed many things but there are very few churches which actually have affordable housing replacing the church feature 
That's correct. I'm not aware of, of them. Some churches, there's one, um, Councillor Perks may be familiar with one out on Queen West where they uh, developed a seniors housing um, facility uh, several years ago. Um, but there are, you're, you're correct, there are many examples of churches that have been converted into market housing. And I'm just looking for, is there anything uh, in, from a planning point of view that we could require those transformations to have a significant amount of affordable housing? given that uh, certainly uh, any of the church sites would be subject to the inclusionary zoning if the site was large enough you know they wouldn't be exempt from that um, and a number of churches have been willing to work as partners with the city on on affordable housing projects okay thank you thank you Councillor by questions of staff <clears throat> just a quick question Linda, have we done any modeling using these guidelines and the depth of the land on um, what would we would get in terms of inclusionary zoning outside of the centers, those two centers that you have? So we've done, um, in terms of population estimates, we've, we've taken a look at no, what inclusionary zoning. So we know that the only buildings over 100 units yeah I'm, I'm just thinking with the heights that we have you would I, i'm wondering and i'm not but it almost feels like you almost had to assemble an entire you know half a block or three quarters of a block in order to get a building that had 100 units so i'm just wondering like what are we getting in there given the depth of the lots that we have the um the um uh, got new guidelines, which are much more permissive than what we have in certain areas. If we have, um, if you know, a high estimate of in that area, what we could get as inclusionary zoning. So through the chair, we we haven't done that estimate yet. Um, it it depends partially on the land assemblies, right? So so people, how large a lot are people able to assemble? And, and we are seeing I, assemblies. I know, but if if we start realizing that you need to assemble three quarters of a block or a block, first of all, what are the chances of that happening? Second, is really that good planning as well that you're going to have a whole building that is going to go all that length? So I'm I'm just wondering if 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 this analysis has been done, like what what really are the chances of us getting any affordable housing through the inclusionary zone in between the centers? How real is this? So we we believe there is an opportunity. We don't have the numbers. We can certainly look at what happens if you were to apply if we had applied inclusionary zoning to some of the projects that have already been built. So, for example, we have projects. Um, Different projects on Danforth with 106 units, 139, 146, um, all either completed or under construction. So we could look at those sites, you know, where, where the land assemblies happened on the Danforth and estimate how many units those would have uh, yielded and try and then extract that to what would happen um, if, you, if you looked at that, you know, across the Danforth. We don't have those exact numbers, but we're happy to take a closer look at it. But we are seeing um, there are opportunities for more than 100 units, and uh, particularly given the changes we've made, provide more flexibility in building footprints, even even on sites which may not be as large as those other sites on the downport. How quickly can you turn around something like that, Linda? Um, so I can bring that back to the team. Um, just one point, and I will ask Nader uh, Kadri to, to jump in on this one in terms of timing based on the analysis we've already done. Um, you've mentioned the nodes, and, and I know your question is outside, outside the nodes. Yeah. yeah. Um, we are taking a very close look because we think there's a big opportunity in nodes for yeah. significant affordable housing, but I'll just pass it on to my colleague Nader and see if he has a comment on how much data he thinks we already have that might help us to put that information together for you. Thanks, Linda, through the chair. Um, so we have, uh, we, do, we do have quite a bit of data that we could take back and um, assemble and uh, give some thought to uh, inclusionary zoning as it relates to the development approach that we're taking along the Denfor. Um, to, to Linda's point, 
Uh, with respect to the urban design guidelines, we have relaxed our rules substantially. We've removed the rear angular plane, which, as you all know, has limited development uh, in the past along um, avenues across the city. Uh, we've also um, created opportunities for additional development on sites that are designated neighborhoods. Um, and when the mid-rise mixed-use developments are paired with developments in transition areas, there is an opportunity for a substantial amount of units to be delivered in a form that uh, is representative of, of sort of the, the, the neighborhood fabric that's there today. Um, the vision for the Danforth is extensive. Uh, it is building on this segment one approach where um, the mid rise. I, I, I just want to know when I can get those numbers. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, so, so through it, the term. Taking in consideration all you said, Nader, which is great. I think we have um, increased the chances of getting more. I'm just wondering if we can have some high level modeling on the, this possibility, given all the new context. Yes. Through the chair, Deputy Mayor, perhaps what we will do is take this away and we will start working on this immediately and we can bring you at least an update for City Council if that's helpful. Yes, um, that's what I was, you, you knew exactly what I was trying to get. I didn't want to put you in a tough situation, but it would be helpful to get some of this information, uh, you know, just before Council at Council, I think. So why don't we take that away? I'm, and we will definitely be able to pull together some data for you before City Council. Okay. Just see. Okay. Sorry. Exhaustive. Okay. Great. Thank you. Are there any other questions of staff? I don't see any. Councillor Fletcher to speak. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm just going to make a little change and just send this without recommendation to council, so we can make some changes if we need to, based on the conversation that we've had here today. Uh, so sorry i had a long motion but it was about affordable housing i will say this is i think the first planning study and thank you mr richardson and your team for coming today but i have pushed and insisted that affordable housing be a core part of this planning study from p1 i've had to have it added in i've focused on it very much and i want to thank the staff for coming along with me on that journey and i think from the discussion we're having we're still on that journey that as far as a key element of any planning study now in the city of Toronto, finding the way to ensure that affordable housing can be part of it is our job. And given that housing crisis, so um, I will say that I think we need to, in every planning study, add that in. Uh, we now have inclusionary zoning, which we didn't have before when it was started. We have MTSAs, which we didn't know were coming when this was started, because it was started, I think, in 2019. So we've been at it for quite a long time. Um, there are, uh, and I think it really behooves us to have a look at it. Just a couple of examples there around what we can or cannot do on the Danforth. But I'll just go back to 838 Broadview that I have discussed with Mr. With Mr. Richardson. Uh, the actual number, it's almost 20% of the total number of units that are affordable. Uh, inclusionary zoning would have given us less than eight units, probably five, based on 7% we have now. We had uh, we have about 19%. So that was an official plan amendment on the, on the uh, official plan, which had been set with the Broadview Avenue study and managed to get whole floor that will be a co-op floor. So I think that wasn't a bad way to do that. Might not be the way we want to do it all the time, but the city does have the right. The city can actually increase the heightened density in order to achieve our goals. And I think our goal, planning in any other way, is affordable housing. I'll also look at the um, house link who like almost, I, they may have given up. I want them not to give up on that property near Greenwood because they couldn't build anything. They have elderly people there. It's the all men, house link, can't climb up the stairs very well anymore. They wanted to build and put an elevator and that was simply shut down because of planning requirements, the guidelines. So I think we really need to look at that again and make them successful. Uh, when this started as well, we did have a housing crisis, but we did not have the housing crisis that we have right at the moment. 
There are a number of churches on the Danforth. The Bowden Church has been in a whole number of times, which is the Baptist Church, currently working with wood green and uh, wood, wood construction for all affordable for that and would exceed the guidelines here because, of course, it's affordable. So there's a whole number of ways to get to this, but um, I am really looking forward to bulking up this report. And I want to thank planning staff and, and Nader Kadri for great work on this. We've done so much work. There's the heritage, there's the public realm, there's houses in behind, there's the parking lots that go along the Danforth on top of on top of the subway. There's a lot of ingredients here. And I'm apologizing for wanting to bulk up the affordable ingredients because that really is now, after all the fantastic work that's been done on all the other elements, that is what is outstanding. And I only wish that the whole study had been done at this point, and I'm sure Councillor Bradford wishes that too, that on east of Coxwell, that we have these mandates that we're going to try to include in here. So uh, I hope the court just has that now, and we'll get that, have a conversation between now and then and see where it goes, if it gets passed or if it comes back for more work. But this is a pretty seminal document, and we have to make sure we're maximizing all of the great work that's been done and maximizing the biggest challenge that we have in the city, which is building uh, affordable housing. So whether it's a private developer, how do they have to add affordable housing? Whether it's a public site, how are we going to maximize affordable housing? I'm very happy. I'm so happy we're having this conversation about the Danforth planning study dealing with affordable housing. Thank you. Thank you. And any questions of the mover? I don't see any. I, I feel compelled to make a few remarks on this item. Um, I'm entirely sympathetic to the need to uh, do everything we can as a city to increase the amount of affordable housing in the city. I'm also well aware of uh, the unbelievable constraints that we face. Like, uh, if you look at this year's budget documents, you'll see that despite the city of Toronto putting in hundreds of millions of dollars to support affordable housing, the provincial government has put in three million and uh, is actually blocking an affordable housing project in North York. Uh, I'm well aware of those constraints. However, I cannot be brought to a place where I, where city council supports two sets of zoning rules, depending on whether you're wealthy enough to live in a privately constructed uh, building or neighborhood or one that is socially owned, not for profit in this case. I just can't do it. If you look at the history, of affordable housing in the city of Toronto, go back. If you could go back to the 50s and 60s and 70s, when design standards were lower, maintenance standards were lower for social housing, if you could go back and say, no, don't do that, that is going to create a terrible problem in the future, you would. The worst planning mistakes in the city of Toronto are those moments when we said people with low incomes do not deserve to live in neighborhoods that are as well designed as the neighborhoods for people with middle and high incomes. It is just fundamentally wrong. It is a, a rock bottom principle that we don't zone people. And we open the door to starting to zone people, we open the door to those mistakes being repeated and even uglier mistakes that we're all aware of in the history of planning in Toronto and North America generally being repeated. We don't zone people. Now, that being said, Mr. Richardson makes a very important point about the need for more affordable housing and how we have to plan for it. He, he keeps going back, though to the issue being the pro forma. The pro forma is just code for, in this instance, 
how much money the not-for-profit has available to them to make the building work. If we start with the idea that good planning is good planning, we have the bill. And for some reason, the private developer can afford to build under those constraints, but the not-for-profit can. It's very simple. We do not provide enough funding support to social housing providers so that they can build on the same in the same conditions as the private market can. It's money. It's not design. As long as we as a society try to cheap out on our obligations to provide housing to everyone who lives here, treating housing as a human right, and cheap out by saying we will allow people with lower incomes to live in conditions we wouldn't accept for people with middle and upper incomes, we are failing. We're not failing with our planning tools. We're failing with money. You solve the problem by having a robust public investment in not-for-profit social and and co-op housing. Mr. Richardson, you know, refers to the St. Lawrence neighborhood. What made the St. Lawrence neighborhood work was not the planning changes. What made it work was a funding regime and environment that does not exist today. We need to reestablish that funding regime and environment. The advocacy we should be making as members of council is for a municipal government, federal government, and by God, a provincial government who recognize that housing is a human right and that the barrier to achieving that is a is a reluctance to make the investment of public money that's where we have to put our act. anyone else wishes ah oh, there goes councillor bala councillor bala you're up councillor perks i wasn't going to speak but you made me speak because i i don't think this is about the designing for poor people or rich people this is about uh designing a city the same planning regulations that allowed, for example, for the mid-rise buildings that we have in our neighborhoods 30 years ago do not allow them now. What was different from, from you know, is, is there a, a different people? Don't forget, be, behind the planning policies, there's also co- all kinds of social um, considerations that come uh, when those policies are being developed. And we need to bring together certain goals. We know that, you know, public space is a, a really important for us now. We know that uh, um, uh, family size units is really important for us now. We know that mixed income communities is really important for us now. And that's why when we develop the building, you know, we need to take those things in consideration because there's the reality of getting it built already as well. It's not only, you know, drawing things in the paper, it's how do we actually translate our policies into actually city building and planning takes in consideration all this. And I think what what I have heard from the deputies is, is this, we have a big issue with housing and your planning policies need to respond in a bigger way to that. This is not about putting people that, you know, uh, live, uh, you know, in a, in a, in a uh, that have lower income uh, in, a, in a certain kind of building, no. It's acknowledging the kind of neighborhoods and the kind of people that we want to build. Because otherwise, you know, what are we protecting? I think Mr. Richton was right. In a lot of these instances, this is sometimes the between it, it, it's the difference between having a project happening and not happening. So when we're talking about the policies that we are creating, what are the major principles? And I think what I've heard is ensure that that affordable housing and housing affordability, and in particularly nonprofit organizations that do good work in this area, have the capacity to still be part of these neighborhoods and these communities. That's what I'm hearing. And that's why that we've been asked to create policies which change all the time. Again, like I said, you know, look at the buildings that were, were done. Most of our rental buildings, you know, have, bigger floor plates than 750 uh, meters. Uh, and, and those are some of the uh, rental I'm stock that stupid. we have, some of the most affordable rental stock that we have in our city. We don't allow it now, all of a sudden. You know, policies evolve and change 
depending on the goals that we have as a city. Let's not forget that. Let's not forget that. And I think that we need to, our policies here need to, to respond to that. This is not about getting a building that is good enough for rich people or, or, or poor people. This is not that. It's about how we have our priorities as a city translate into city building in both the physical way and the social way. Thank you. Are there any other speakers to the item? Okay, uh, we have a motion from Councillor Fletcher to send oh, sorry, the Sorry, I'd oh, like to speak, Mr. Chairman. Councillor Bradford, Bradford, go ahead. Yep. Yeah. No, I, I would just add that there's a lot of subjectivity around these different guidelines. And, and as Deputy Mayor Bailau said, uh, the policies, the viewpoints, the perspective, the guidelines, these things are evolutionary. They change over time. You look at our city two decades ago at the point of amalgamation, you, you consider where we are today, you consider the order of the magnitude of the challenges facing the future success of Toronto. And I think that needs to be reflected in our policies. Uh, it's not about creating classes of citizens. It's about, you know, moving the needle on the housing file. And I think that our not-for-profit partners face enormous challenges uh, at all levels of government. We could, we could spend the next two hours talking about all the challenges associated with the federal programs that are intended to help not-for-profit sector that, in fact, actually have very limited uptake because of the way that they're structured. Like, there are big, big issues uh, in order to deliver these projects. And yet we're at this moment of inflection where we're all taking stock of the magnitude of the housing crisis in front of us. And at the local level, without the injection of, of you know, tremendous amounts of cash at a local level, municipal government, there are things that we can do from a policy perspective, from a guideline perspective that reprioritizes delivering affordable housing for people here in this city. And, and we have guidelines and or lack of guidelines or things that prioritize that collective priority. More housing now, more affordable housing now, more affordable housing yields and unit counts on these projects that are going to be delivered in the not-for-profit sector and, uh, and are going to ensure that uh, affordability for decades to come. So I think it is evolutionary. I don't think it's, you know, classes of citizens. I think it's about what policy levers do we have at this order of government to make these projects work and our planning priorities. And I think writ large, our priorities as, as a city and the policies that inform those priorities ought to reflect those objectives. And that's what this discussion is about. That's all for me. Okay, are there any other speakers? Councillor Fletcher, thank you for bringing this item to us. <laughs> Finally, we're going to talk about affordable housing in a planning report. The first yeah. time. Thank you so much, everybody. Yeah, got the juices flowing. Okay. So, uh, sorry uh, to interrupt uh, to the chair. Um, Council, sure. we didn't actually uh, have Councillor Fletcher's motion on the screen. Um, I understand. So, should we, Councillor Fletcher, would you like that motion displayed? Yes, please. Thank Just you. Refer to. Does Mike Layton have a drum kit behind him? Oh my God. Hey, you want me to give you a backbeat? Absolutely. We need a rhythm track to, to these No, 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 that's not the, the motion. The rhythm track sorry, to this discussion I'm would sorry. be. Yeah. I shouldn't have, I'm just referring it, I'm sending it without recommendation, the whole thing. Yes. If, if the clerk could just put up the motion to uh, send the item to council without a uh, recommendation. recommendation. And then we can have a, a flourish by Councillor Layton. That's okay. We, well, we don't have that one ready, but I mean, I think if you just move um, that the Thank item you. be sent to Council yeah. without rec, that should be fine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ellen. Thank you. Sorry to confuse you. My apologies. Oh, it's uh, just the fact that we can manage the meeting at all. Isn't it? It's amazing. Yes. It is. You're doing great, Gord. No, Ellen's doing great. I'm just, I'm just the face of, okay. All right. On a motion uh, to refer the item to council or send the item to council without recommendations, all those in favor? Opposed, if any? That carries. All right. Uh, uh oh, I got locked out. We spent so much time on that. <laughs> My computer timed out. Hang on a sec. Look at that. Oh, no.
Okay. All right. So our next item is TE31.13. Which is 260 to 270 and 274 to 322 King Street West, extension of part lot control exemption application final report. I do not have any uh, notice has been given on this item. I do not have any deputations listed. Are there any questions of staff? Seeing none, Councillor Cressy. I'll move the staff recommendations. Thank you. All those in favor, oppose, carry. Item TE31.14, alterations to a heritage property and authority to enter into a heritage easement agreement at 545 Lakeshore Boulevard West. I do not have any deputations listed on this item. Councillor Cressy. I'll move the staff recommendations. Thank you. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE. Uh, oh. One sec. Let me just check something. Okay. 14A doesn't have any recommendations. Item TE 31.15 alteration to a heritage property and authority to enter into a heritage agree easement agreement, 250 University Avenue. I do not have any deputations on this item. Are there any questions of staff? Seeing none, Councillor Cressy. I'll move the staff recommendations. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Give me a second. I have to do some fancy footwork here. Okay, item TE31.16, alterations to a designated heritage property at 330 University. I do have a deputation on this. Robert Bader. Uh, yes, good evening, Chair members. Um, I'm just here to answer any questions that the uh, staff may have or, or uh, the members may have. Pastor okay, are there any questions for Mr. Bader? No? Uh, Robert, thank you very much for making yourself available. That was the only deputant I had listed on this item. Uh, are there any questions of staff? Seeing none, Councillor Cressy. I'll move the staff recommendations. Thank you. All those in favor, opposed, carry. Oh. Item TE 31.17, demolition of a structure within the South Rosedale Heritage Conservation so District. Oh. Uh, within the South Rosedale Heritage Conservation District, an approval of a replacement structure at 12 Clooney Drive. I have no deputants on this item. Are there any questions of staff? Seeing none, Councillor Layton, over to you. I'll move the staff recommendation. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE 31.18, construction of a building within the Garden District Heritage Conservation District. Hmm. 294 through 298 Sherburn Street. We do not have any deputants listed on this item. Are there any questions of staff? Seeing none, Councillor Wong Pam. Uh, yes, thank you. I'd like to move the uh, staff recommendations as well as the recommendations from the letter from the Preservation Board. Uh, okay. I, um, Councillor, can I just ask you, nothing in the letter contradicts the staff report, correct? Uh, that is correct. It's essentially adopting the, uh, the, the the staff recommendations that went to the preservation board. I just figured that both of them can go together. So I just want to make sure we do we do this right. So the recommendations in the staff report mirror and reflect the letter from the preservation board. Correct. The staff. So we don't need to move both. Just by moving the staff recommendations, we're okay, right? That um, is correct. I think we should move both. Okay. Is that right? Okay. So, Thank okay. Thank you to the clerk for assistance on that. 
Um, Councillor Wong Tam, the floor is yours. Okay, then I'd like to move the staff recommendations. Okay, any remarks or are we good? Uh, no, just, I know we have a very long agenda, so um, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, anyone, any questions of the mover? Anyone else wish to speak? No? Okay, uh, on the staff recommendations then, all in favor, opposed, carry. Uh, get back. Item TE 31.19, um, two through six, Howard Park Avenue, official plan and zoning amendment bylaw application. Request for directions. Uh, I do not have any deputants on this item. Are there any questions of staff? Seeing none, uh, I'll move the staff recommendations. All those in favor, opposed, carry. Item TE 31.20. 471 through 479 Queen Street East zoning bylaw amendment application request for directions report. I do have a deputant. Actually, I have several deputants on this item. Uh, first, Catherine Bray. Catherine, are you with us? This is Yes. Okay. Um, thank you. First of all, as somebody else mentioned, it's really fascinating seeing our city at work and uh, gives me a lot of hope because one of the things I'm concerned with as a resident in Corktown is that it feels like the secondary plan that we all put a lot of effort into, um, all being the community as well as the city and the planners and city staff and the councillor, gets, um, uh, well, I can't say ignored by when the planning approvals go through but that's kind of what it feels like as a resident that we agree on four-story height and then developers get 12-story height um so in particular on this particular one i'm very pleased to see that the city is uh, asking for the city councillor to um the city solicitor rather to object um and appear at the hearing to object it's too large too high too much shadowing um the massing is wrong there's issues with the back lane, all sorts of stuff, which all have been identified. But in particular, I wanted to, so all of those are really important, but I also want to mention two other issues, which I'd like you to take into account on this project and also on other projects. And the first one is um, the developer is providing less parking than the zoning requires. And what happens is people don't buy the parking, but they still have cars. And um, they then apply for street permit parking. And there is not enough street permit parking for the existing housing. And you know, as you know, we've got Bright Street, we've got Trinity Street, we've got heritage housing in the area that doesn't have the ability to have built a garage or have a driveway. Um, and people do still have cars. And um, so my request is that for this development and for future developments, you put in the provisions that mean that users and purchasers of um, these new developments are not entitled to street parking permits for overnight. And I know that there's a complicated mechanism for doing this. Pam McConnell and I talked about it when they did 90 Trinity Street, Trinity and Eastern, because they thought they got it covered, but people, they are still allowed to get street parking permits. Um, apparently it has to be like in the condominium documents, in the agreement of purchase and sale, and something that the city puts in as a condition of the zoning approval and in site plan. Like it's a complicated process, I presume you guys know, but it has to be done in a way that's effective so they can't get street parking permits. That's my first main point. The second point is where you're not dealing with rebuilding a heritage building that has to be a certain size, a certain um, dimension, please make the sidewalks wider. The sidewalks need to be wider across the city. We've noticed this for sure during the pandemic. But even outside of the pandemic, there's more people walking. This is a good thing. There's more people using our sidewalks. There's more baby carriages on the sidewalks. There's, there's people with dogs. There needs to be wider room. So I, my second request for this project and for future projects, that you make sure the sidewalks are all widened. 
I realize that where you have an older building, it's not, it's going to be narrow and then it's going to get wider, but eventually you will end up with wider sidewalks and at least the pinch points are reduced. Those are my requests. Thank you. Are there any questions for Catherine? No, I don't see any. Okay. Thank you, Catherine, for sharing your thoughts with us today. Our next deputy is Andre Berman. Andre, are you with us? Yes, hello. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and hello, members of Community Council. Uh, my name is Andre Berman, and I am the current chair of the Corktown Residents and Business Association, which is a nonprofit volunteer group uh, that represents uh, uh, varying interests in Corktown neighborhood uh, located in Toronto's downtown east. Um, I, I'd like to make note that the CRBA uh, has been engaging uh, with uh, with its constituents um, and a local councillor, uh, uh, Councillor Wong Tam, and city staff early in this application, and we have done so uh, afterwards quite often. Um, we are encouraged and relieved uh, that the city planning has uh, recommended to continually to oppose uh, this development at the OLT. Um, um, since the OT hearing has started on February 4th. Um, I, I won't go in into a lot of the specifics uh, that were uh, flagged to our organization on the litany of concerns, uh, but I do want to emphasize one point, and that uh, has to do with the adjacent laneway. Um, there is a, a sizable laneway located south of the site that is an orphaned uh, laneway, a product of uh, Corktown's industrial and, uh, and kind of blue collar past. Um, it's a private lane, um, and there really isn't a lot of rules and regulations uh, 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 kind of uh, producing some rules for this laneway, and therefore it, it's just a kind of a laissez faire right of way for all uh, adjacent uh, residents and, and commercial buildings. Uh, what what Brad Lamb, or so the applicant, uh, and his uh, study has uh, indicated um, is, is really not sufficient in terms of the realities of the laneway use. Uh, the applicant is suggesting 33 parking spaces, uh, which would need to be accessed through the laneway. Um, and we, we don't believe that the studies shown accurately depicts the laneway. It's a very narrow laneway. It's only accessed on two ends, and uh, cars cannot enter and exit at the same time. Um, if there is, if this is approved at 33 parking spaces, uh, there's going to be a lot of dancing around this laneway, which, by the way, is also used by residents and, and commercial users. We really do would recommend and request that city planning and city staff take a closer look at the use of this laneway and perhaps uh, have more conscious effort to negotiate with the applicant on the number of parking spaces used. Um, it's 33, which we believe is far too many. Um, and we know that there, are, there have been recent bylaws passed with the city planning, el eliminating the limited, a, a, a limit number of parking spaces. Um, there is another site uh, that the applicant has proposed is 44 stories. And I believe on 15 parking spaces. So, you know, it's it's not out of the question to significantly reduce parking spaces and therefore significantly reduce the use of the lane. Uh, we we hope that city staff can take a can take a closer look at that um, as the OLT as the OLT hearing proceeds. Thank you so much. Thank you. Are there any questions for Andre? Sandy, Andre, thank you for sharing your thoughts with us today. Next, I have Anne Docena. Anne, are you with us? Yes, I am. Welcome. You have five minutes to address the committee. You can start as soon as you're ready. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chairman and uh, Councillors. Um, I want to thank the planner for his report. I'm very concerned about the added traffic of the cars and 180 bicycles will be able to integrate traffic on the main Queen Street as an artery with access to the Don Valley Parkway or to accommodate the necessary service vehicles for its residents' safety. 
On page 29 or 31 in the report, you can see the T-shaped heritage laneways that Andre has just mentioned. These, these community shared heritage laneways serve the parking and access and exits of commercial buildings, private homes, and heritage row houses on Queen Bright and Sumac streets. They are extremely busy during normal working times. Neighbors work to make these function and keep the peace. Even without traffic, vehicles which enter the condo building from Queen Street will have great difficulty to exit into these tiny laneways and maneuver turning left or right. Regarding loading space, please reconsider the limited space for loading at the center of the intersection of the two lanes, already identified as fire lanes. The parking spaces occupied by Magic Building tenants are at the side of the north-south lane next to Magic's loading dock. These are not shown on the maps. Fire and ambulance vehicles are too big to move in these lanes. They must park on either Bright or Sumac and need 24-7 access through the fire laneways to carry their equipment to where it's needed. Regarding the two reports, traffic input, November 20th, 20, 2020, page 10, which also includes transportation services impacting parking, and soil solid waste dated April 29, 2021, on page 11, which were, I believe, completed by the applicant's company, AB Group, and although accepted by engineering and construction, they were both done during the pandemic when everything was closed down and are not representative of normal busy life. I respectfully request some further study and discussion here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anne. Are there any questions? No? Anne, thank you very much for sharing your thinking with us today. Um, the next decadent I have listed is Don Martin. Don, are you with us? I am. Good afternoon, Don. Um, Thank welcome. You. You, you have five minutes to address the committee. You can start as soon as you're ready. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Many of my points have been made, but I'll be reading from notes, so I will be repeating things you have heard today. Perspective. My husband moved on to Bright Street in 1971, 51 years ago. We married in 74, so that gives me 48 years on the street. We are the longest standing residence on Bright. No nostalgia today, just facts. My written remarks list many what if, how will XYZ be handled, and possible future scenarios. Today I'll highlight our most important concerns and leave you with questions and requests. Overview. The development site sits on Queen Street East, between Bright Street on the west and Sumac on the east. Bright and Sumac are both one-way streets running south to King. Sumac has traffic lights at both Queen and King. Bright does not. There is a private laneway running east and west between Bright and Sumac, 26 meters or 85 feet south of Queen. There is an auxiliary lane that runs south from there, backing onto seven properties on Bright Street. Number 21, 29, I mean, 31, 33, 35, 37, 39, and 43, Bright, have a dated right-of-way over these lanes. The private lane is not orphaned, is not used in a laissez-faire manner. An owner exists, um, and this is a fire lane. Survey. The entrance from Bright Street to the east-west lane is 3.62 meters wide, or 11 and 3 quarters feet. The entrance from Sumac to the east-west lane is 3.48 meters wide, or just under 11 and a half feet. The width of the north-south lane at the junction with the east-west narrows to 3.058 meters, or 10.03 feet. These measurements show that two-way traffic is not possible. Pictures. I have submitted with my remarks 14 pictures which are labeled and give a visual example of the width of the lane. On the January 31st request for direction, page 9, transportation. Vehicular access to the North South Drive driveway from Queen will be impeded by streetcars that stop because of their length to stop on Queen. 
is there permission of use from the owner of the east, west, and north south laneway? Page nine again. There are 21 new two way vehicular trips proposed by the uh, transportation experts. Where do these vehicles and vehicles during the rest of the day and night wait for the elevator? Page nine, parking. Quote, transportation services accept proposed parking provisions. Visitor retail demand can be accommodated in existing parking facilities in the area. End quote. There are no existing parking parking facilities in this area. Only street permit parking on Bright, Sumac, St. Paul, metered parking on King and Queen, which is not available during rush hour. Page 10, loading. The loading space is mentioned, read the north to south laneway, it is not shown on drawings. Page 11, solid waste. Type G loading space with adjacent staging pad is mentioned, but not shown on the architectural drawing. It states the site is within 250 meters of a closed landfill. The solid waste department, City of Toronto, could not supply me with details, yet it is, in mention, it is mentioned here. The architectural plans, A104, give an overhead satellite view of the site, a la Google Maps. A200, traffic flow simulation shows the vehicles entering the site driveway only eastbound from Queen, moving south to the east-west lane, then exiting on to Sumac. The simulation does not anticipate any traffic entering the east-west lane from Bright to access the site. There is no traffic simulation for garbage pad on North Hill Lane, as mentioned in request for direction. No suspect site quoted on lane width. How will garbage trucks maneuver on the car elevator? How many times a week will traffic have to wait for the elevator? Request a new transportation audit phase, taking into account increase of traffic heading south on Bright and facing the bottleneck created due to the new longer streetcars, a new distillery line, and new no right turn on red restriction at Cherry. Traffic will be lined up on Bright. There will be a temptation to turn up to Queen, yes, the wrong way, on a one way street, but it's only 26 meters, 85 foot temptation. And how do we police this one way? My biggest fear is an increase in the number of cars heading north as I enter Bright. Request emergency services audit, fire, ambulance, rescue services. Request a water utilities and solid waste audit. How will our services be affected by increased use due to increased in density? What is the age of water and sewer pipes? I'd like a city of salt, city of solid waste management report on the closed municipal landfill status. I'd like a floodplain audit for Don River tributaries that run through area adjoining the site. There's less natural runoff opportunities than Dixon Hall on 58 soon that paved the playground in the late 1970s, less since Dixon Hall built an addition in the mid-1980s, and even less since building a condo at 52 Zuma. The loss of areas of natural runoff with this, with this development building to be set back and proposed paving of East West Lane. Grand finale. Ignore for a moment the questions of density, height, shadows, wind, the Planning Act. Park Street and Sumac Street are narrow one way streets. The East West Lane and North West Lanes were designed to service the houses built, wait for it, Don, circa Don, 1877. Well Could you please just finish your, your last thought? Okay. Nothing can change the basics of this area, which were built in 1877. Much of will which still exists. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that completes the list of deputants I have on this item. Are there any questions of staff? Okay, I don't see any. Councillor Wong Tan, floor is yours. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you to you as well as to the deputants who took time from their busy day to spend a little bit of, uh, of, of the time with us to express their, their grave concerns about this application, which I wholeheartedly uh, share. I'd like to move the recommendations in the staff report and to direct the city solicitor, city planning staff to, uh, to oppose the application in its current form. Uh, as you've already heard from, from our very eloquent and passionate residents, there are a number of serious, uh, cons uh, serious infractions uh, regarding this application. I share them. And, uh, and I just want to cite a few of them because I think it's important for us to, to really hone in on what's happening in this area, uh, as we know, it's historic Cork Town. Uh, the application is aggressive, it is oversized, it is too tall, and it is coming, uh, crashing down on a site that's too small. 
I'm not using that language that is grammatic, but rather just describing the condition in the area. Our last speaker, uh, Dawn Martin, thank you. Uh, I think she eloquently said it the best, uh, which is that when you have an existing infrastructure in an in a, in a area, in a neighborhood that has small fine grain features, such as narrow laneways, narrow streets, uh, the type of uh, development that we have to see in, in, in order for it to work has to be sensitive to the existing context. Now, I, I, I was very mindful of the, of the previous conversation about, uh, uh, you know, the deputants um, uh, who were advocating for, for the throwing of the, um, uh, or perhaps a disregard of, of guidelines. Uh, when it comes to um, achieving certain social goods. And perhaps there may be an argument made there. Uh, but in this case, we have someone um, in this in this case is the developer, Brad J. Lamb, who's got an application that wants to throw every single guideline out the window. They don't uh, want to adhere to the mid-rise guidelines. They don't want to adhere to the secondary plan, the, the King's uh, Parliament's secondary plan. They don't want to adhere to uh, our downtown plan, Teal Core. They don't want to adhere to the official plan. And, uh, and at the same time, they're asking us to sort of bust through the envelope so that, uh, that they can build whatever it is that he wants to build. It doesn't make sense uh, for us to have two sets of rules. Um, and it certainly doesn't make sense is that he's asked for all of that. And there's no affordable housing. So we know that uh, already the streets are, are, are fairly challenged, especially with existing conditions that they are. And, uh, and they're not going to necessarily get better. They're going to get worse especially with the construction of the Ontario line, the diversion of other um, uh, construction projects and the, and the diversion of, of traffic uh, into this area. But I do want to focus on, on one thing. Uh, the proposed uh, building does not have the appropriate height, the massing, the density. It doesn't fit with the adjacent properties. It is not uh, transitioning well to the adjacent neighborhood. There is no contextual appropriateness uh, for this building in the area, uh, which means that if, if this if the proof that the OLT, uh, we're probably going to see the march of towers in an area that's already very uh, challenged because of the physical constraints of the size of the streets. Will it have a negative precedent for for Queen Street in the surrounding area? Absolutely. Have city planning staff cited that in the report? They have. Uh, does the does the applicant uh, disregard? The uh, heritage uh, context of Queen Street East, uh, yes, they do. Is there insufficient transition to the adjacent low-rise residential neighborhood? Yes, that also exists. Um, do we have adequate step-backs, setbacks, and angular planes? Something that uh, a previous applicant spoke about. All of those rules, once again, disregarded. There are so many outrageous challenges with this application. I know that the um, community is uh, is quite concerned, and I think that they have a lot of legitimate right to be. There have been conversations that I had in the neighborhood, not necessarily here, where there are concerns about an application. We work it out, we massage it, and we say yes to it. In its current form, without significant reduction of height, without considerations for the local uh, conditions, there's just no way we can support it. Not here, not at the OLT and that uh, we have to continue to oppose it because what will happen is that if the OLT comes back and gives us a mediocre settlement that all of a sudden we have to face an acceptance for, we're going to do something very dramatic uh, to this neighborhood. And I'm not one to be alarmist, I'm actually being very realistic, is that this would be a horrible, absolutely horrible precedent for this neighborhood and it'll be a horrible precedent for other neighborhoods if this was happening uh, elsewhere. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, any questions, Councillor Wong Tam? No. Anyone else to speak? No. All right. All those in favor? Opposed, if any, that carries. So now we go to item 3122 residential demolition application 71 and 80 Innes Avenue. Uh, I'm sorry I to interrupt have, uh, to the chair. It would be item yes. 21. Oh, thank God you're here, Ellen. We we just litter the city with the illegal actions if you weren't here to save us from ourselves. Okay. <clears throat> item TE 31.21, 294 through 298 Sherburn Street, official plan amendment, zoning up amendment applications, request for directions report. 
I do not have any deputants listed. Are there any questions of staff? Seeing none, Councillor Wong Tam. Um, thank you very much, um, Chair. I'm going to be moving the recommendations in the staff report. The recommendations are uh, to direct the city solicitor to continue to oppose the application. It's not acceptable in its current form. It's got a long way to go. Um, and I'm hoping uh, that we can find some type of resolution uh, there. Uh, but if not, then we'll continue to oppose it uh, until we get a better outcome for the community. Thank you very much. Thank you. All those, any, any questions of the mover? Anyone else to speak? No. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Now we can do item 22. Item TE31.22, Residential Demolition Application 71 and 80 Ennis Avenue. I have no deputants listed. Councillor Bailao. Thank you, Chair. I'm moving recommendation three, so approve, but uh, there are certain conditions that have to be met. Okay. Uh, on recommendation three, then all we those just in favor, have a moment opposed. to display. Thank you so much. Sure. Okay. So, on that recommendation, all those in favor, opposed, carry. Item TE 31.23 Residential Demolition Application 101 Heath Street West. Uh, I have no deputants listed on the item. Uh, any questions of staff? No, Councillor Malcolm. I have a motion. I've been advised by staff, uh, legal and planning, that given that the item is at the OLT, that this should be deferred uh, until obviously uh, that is settled. Okay. Any questions of the mover? No. Anyone else wish to speak to the matter? Okay. On Councillor Matlow's motion to defer, all those in favor? Opposed, if any, that carries. Item TE 31.24, residential demolition application 250 Church Street. I do not have any deputants listed. Are there any questions of staff? Seeing none, I, uh, Councillor Wong Tam. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. I'd like to move uh, the recommendations uh, in the report and specifically uh, number three, option number three. Okay, there's option number three on the screen. Are there any questions of the mover? Seeing none, does anyone else wish to speak to the item? No? Okay, all those in favor of motion to item th recommendation three, all those opposed, if any, that carries. Item 3125, application to remove a private tree at 144 High Park Avenue. Uh, I do not have any deputants listed. Um, I'll move the staff recommendation, which is deny the request. Any questions? Me? No. Anyone else wish to speak? No. All those in favor? I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry to the chair on this on the on this item. We do have a motion um, to withdraw this item. Oh, the applicant did remove. My, my yes, fault. I'm sure someone told me about that, and I, I lost track. Thank you. Okay. So instead, uh, I'll move a motion to withdraw the item. All those in favor? Opposed, if any? That carries. Okay. Oh my goodness. Item TE 21 or 31.26 Front Yard Parking Appeal 624 Davenport Road. I do not have any deputants uh, listed on the item. Are there any questions of staff? Seeing none, Councillor Matlow. Mr. Chair, I'm going to support the resident and move a motion to approve the alternate recommendation to approve. Uh, the appeal. Um, 
this is a case where um, there's no direct parking on Davenport uh, nearby the residence home. There is no greenery, no no trees, no soft landscaping that will be removed. Um, it's 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 already existing. This is really a question about whether or not this resident will have uh, uh, more access and more easy access uh, or not uh, from their home, and that's it. So I think it's a completely reasonable request on this uh, applicant's part. Um, and moreover, uh, they've received the overwhelming support of their nearby neighbors, and uh, and, uh, and I hope that you will support this resident's request as well. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Any questions of the mover? No. I'm going to move the staff recommendation, which is to deny and uh, place certain obligations. Uh, to restore a section of the paved area to green space to the satisfaction of the general manager of transportation. Any questions of me? Yeah. No, no. I, I, I was, I'm so sorry. sorry. Yes. Mr. Chair, I I think I have questions of staff. I'm just looking at the picture of the house and I'm okay. a puzzle that actually the resident has to apply because he has a garage. I thought people were allowed to park. Okay, 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 okay. Slow down, slow down. Councillor Matt, oh, slow down. Everybody, slow down. Be patient. Um, okay, we are at 12.25. Uh, I know that at least one member of the community council has appointments over lunch. So okay. what I'm going to suggest... You know what? For, no, no, yeah. no, no. I saw several hands go up. I saw several hands go up. So what I'm going to suggest is that uh, we hold this down until after the lunch break. I, we are we are actually doing quite well, guys. Um, we've, with the exception of this item, we have now managed all the, the statutory items and and all but two of the items with deputations. I think we only have another four or five items to do after lunch. So uh, I'm just going to suggest that we break now. Recess and return at one thirty. Okay. Any objection to that? No. no. Thank you very much. Okay. See you all in, in just a little over an hour.
Okay, uh, welcome back. Uh, I, the meeting is now resumed. When we broke at lunch, we were on item TE 31.26, Front Yard Parking Appeal 624 Davenport Road. I understand, Councillor Matlow, you have an update for us? Yes, thank you. Um, I'm going to move to defer the item based on um, uh, issues that have been raised by staff that we want to resolve with staff and the appellant. Okay, so we have a motion to, to the. Our, uh, sorry sorry to interrupt to the meeting. chair. There were two motions moved on this item before lunch, so perhaps okay. they could be withdrawn by the movers first, and then we are just getting um, that motion to defer ready, and it's for one cycle, right, Councillor Matlow? Yes. Sorry, does the motion to defer just not take precedence anyway? Well, I have to dispose of the other two motions. Yes, it does. It does, yes. And indeed. if we vote to defer, the other two just sit there. So we don't need to deal with them. We can just defer, right? Uh, yes, you can do it that way too. Yeah, of course. Sure. Let's do that. Okay, thank okay. you. Uh, on Councillor Matlow's motion to defer, all those in favor, opposed, carry. Okay. The next item is uh, TE 31.38, uh, which is the 569573 uh, Christie Street Zoning Bylaw Amendment Application Preliminary Report. And uh, to the staff, I'm very sorry. I've lost the screen. That temporarily lost the screen that lists the deputant's name. Could I perhaps have staff call the deputant for me? This is the host to the chair. The deputant listed is Ian Flett. I'm now unmuting Ian Flett. Thank you so much. Ian, welcome. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, councillors. Uh, this is one of those uh, road paved with good intentions. I'm simply here on behalf of the applicant first to thank staff for all of their efforts and diligence uh, and to be available to hear any of your comments and to answer any questions. That's all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ian. We appreciate that. Are there any questions for Ian? No, I don't see any. Ian, thank you so much for making yourself available. Uh, thank you. Is that, uh, to the host, is that all the deputants on this item? To the chair, that's correct. There was only one listed deputant. Thank you so much. Um, are there any questions of staff? No. Uh, is this Councillor Matlow, I believe? Yes. yes. Thank yeah. you. Councillor Matlow, uh, the floor uh, is yours. Uh, thank you. I'm, I'm uh, moving the preliminary report for the meeting. Okay. Um, all those in favor, opposed if any, that carries. Um, the next item is TE 31.52. Oh no, we just did fight. No, we didn't. Uh, TE 31.52, please excuse me guys, I'm just having a mess here. Um, construction staging area time extension 387 to 403 Bloor Street East. We do have a deputant on the item. Could the host please call the deputant? The deputant for this item is Linda Brett. I'm now unmuting your line. Good afternoon, Linda. Are you with us? This is the host to Linda Brett. Your line is currently unmuted. This is the host to Linda Brett. Your line is currently unmuted. You've been called to depute on item TE 31.52. To the chair, it appears Linda just muted uh, just muted themselves. I'm going to unmute again. Linda, you are now unmuted. To the chair, if you can give me a moment, I believe we can connect Linda by phone. Okay, thank you.
This is the host to Linda Brett. We are attempting to reach you at the phone number you provided when you made uh, when you emailed TYCC to depute. If you could please answer that line. Thank you. To the chair, I believe we've successfully connected Linda. I'm now unmuting her line. Sorry, Linda, I just had to mute you again. Uh, if we could ask if you're listening to this meeting on any other device, that that device be muted because we're getting an echo. I'm now going to unmute your phone line again. I don't know where you've got me. To the chair, um, it sounded like the speaker asked why we called them. Um, To the chair, this is the host. Uh, it appears that the that Linda Brett did not intend to speak. Okay, uh, and that was the only listed deputy, correct? That is correct. Okay, then. Are there any questions of staff on this item? I don't see any. I believe Councillor Wong Tam, this is yours. Yeah. Uh, yes, thank you. Maybe I, if I can just uh, have a few minutes to ask some quick questions. Um, Go ahead. Yep. Thank you. This is a this is a matter that was. Oh, sorry. Um, I'm getting a note from my staff person that that uh, that indicates that Linda Brett, who's the president of the Lower East Neighborhood Association, was intending to speak. I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. I know you look. Uh, I know this is very frustrating with all the tech issues. Uh, perhaps if Linda does come back, we could give her an opportunity. Uh, Ford is just so you know, uh, apparently she wants to be here. She wants to speak. Uh, she's been waiting a long time to have her moment to, to address us. Okay. What I'm going to suggest then is that uh, we stand this item down uh, to give city staff an opportunity to work out a path for Linda to be able to share her thoughts with us um, and move along to item TE31.73. Improving pedestrian safety at Front Street and Frederick Street. I do not have any deputants on that item. Mr. Chair, can I interrupt, interrupt you for one second, please? I'd just like our clerk to know I've sent her a slight amendment for Dawn Land's uh, uh -huh. item um, and thank her just so she knows it's there. We could probably do it that very quick. That's okay. That's all. So, thank you. Yep. Uh, Councillor Wong Tam, uh, on yes. M73, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and uh, this was a matter that I was trying to address earlier, um, and you alerted us that we did have a, a fourth quarter of 2022. Uh, just by way of interest, um, and I do have an amendment, is that we would like to have the transportation staff um, re review the capital plan and report back uh, in the July meeting of 2022, uh, um, so as quickly as possible, really. I was hoping to give staff more time, but it sounds to me like just given the, the, the truncated uh, uh, reduced number of meetings that perhaps uh, we need to advance this work. Uh, Ellen, do you have that motion? I'm sorry, it's just so hard in a, in a virtual setting. Um, do you have that motion? Do you need to put that on the screen? In a nutshell, I'm amending the recommendations in my letter, asking staff to report back earlier. We'll just wait to the on. chair, I apologize, <laughs> but we are not sure which item we're on. This is item 73. Thank you. Could I just have one second? Absolutely. I'm amazed that we're getting anything done at all. Oh, 
Okay, thank you, Ellen. Um, so we're having we're making the request of having staff report back to the um, the June 29th meeting of TYCC, which then means uh, the staff will have the the July and uh, month to report back through, I guess, City Council. Um, and I guess I, if if I can, it's a technical issue. I know this is what I'm what I'm putting before you is not very controversial. This is just a message to the clerk. Um, on the um, monthly calendar review of TIMS, uh, it does show that there is a September meeting as first meeting of the new council term. Um, and uh, so just wanted to flag that because um, uh, mm. originally we were looking at that calendar and for some odd reason it did show that there was a, uh, there was a November meeting of the first council um, and then uh, later on, uh, that's a special meeting for council based sworn and, and, uh, and then subsequently um, uh, the, the full council meeting. Sorry. Okay. Did you say there's a did you say Timus shows a council meeting in September? Yeah, not to um, take sorry, us the, the, too far the, off topic. The September meeting, just, just so you guys know, I investigated this for other reasons. The uh clerk has held two meeting dates after July, just in case there are any statutory issues we have to deal with on planning or heritage matters. They are not regular business meetings of council. Right. Uh, Yes, thank you, Chair. I wasn't speaking about the uh, the August or September meeting. I was actually talking about the monthly the month display on Timis. Um, I don't want to get into it too deeply, but it does show that there's a, a meeting, a special meeting of City Council on November the 17th. That's the one I was referring to. Oh, I thought you said to August. Sorry. I, I may have got the dates wrong, but no, that meeting is not for general business. The last general business is July. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, so we put that aside. We've made our we ended our motion to have it accelerate. So we're going to skip over all of that messiness. Um, and the request to staff is to come back in June. Okay. Thank you. All right. So we'll just wait to have. I did. I'm sorry. Did I miss it? Was the it, it was shown? It, it was shown. Okay. Yeah. Trying to manage three things at once here. Okay. Uh, are there any questions of the mover? No. Anyone else wish to speak? No. Okay. Uh, so we'll take the amended uh, motion. All those in favor? Opposed, if any, that carries. Uh, 86 is an in camera item. Um, if uh, do we have the deputy in 452 available yet? We believe we'll be able to connect them successfully. One moment. Okay, so let's go to item T31.52, construction staging area, time extension 387 to 403 Bloor Street East, with thanks to uh, city, the city's technical staff. Yep, thank you. Oh, I have them up here. Oh, yeah. Councillor Fletcher, your microphone is hot. <laughs> We've muted Councillor Fletcher. Thank you. We have Linda Brett now connected. I am unmuting Linda's mic. Linda, can Hello? you hear us? Hi, Linda. Oh, you Linda. are. Yes, I can. Um, can, I'm, can you hold on a second? Or am I on the meeting? You're in the meeting now, Linda. Welcome. It's Councillor Perks okay. here, the chair of the committee. Uh, we <laughs> thank you so much for being patient until we could figure out the technical problems. So um, you, you have five minutes now in which to address the committee. Uh, please begin when you're ready. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, chair and members of the committee. My name is Linda Brett, and I'm president of the Bloor Street East Neighborhood Association, which is an incorporated nonprofit community association. We do not have a BIA within our within most of our footprint, including the area around this, this site. We have as members both the National Post Building and Rogers Communication Head Office, which is close to the site. The subject site is located on the south side of Bloor Street East and west of the Sherburne subway station, located on the southeast corner of Bloor and Sherburne. Our recommendations are contained on page one of our submission, 
and will be discussed as I go through the pictures attached. The pictures start on page four of the submission, uh, and the first batch, batch deal with bike lane issues. Page four shows a cement truck occupation on either side of the site to, uh, within a, a bike lane. The blog Peel wrote an article on the dangers of this site this fall, and improvements from then have been have been have, or have happened. But you can still see the the issues related to to this kind of occupation, and we ask how this is zero vision zero enforcement. Page five to eight show uh, page five at eight a.m. shows delivery of goods again within within the bike lane. It's a good thing we have COVID traffic. Page six and seven show other conditions. Uh, other conditions of the bike lane, including a, a vehicle in the bike lane. Um, eight, page eight and nine show the intersection of the Bloor, Street, Bloor and, and Sherburn just, just past the site. Uh, placing posts to delineate the bike lanes at this point place is not viable as the construction trucks need this space to, to maneuver. The final picture shows a bike shows a cyclist attempting to turn on what should be at one bike lane to another. Note the vehicle and the bike are reversed, and we have a bike lane on Bloor Street and we have a white bike lane on Sherburn. The remaining pictures re relate to the pedestrian experience. And from our original discussion on the pedestrian protection a few years ago, we asked for a better walkway, including something like duck walk over the sidewalk to allow for drainage. Underneath, underneath to protect our footwear. We've asked for these measures continually as the permit gets renewed without success. Page 10 shows you entering the walkway from east, and from the east, including if you were coming from the subway. Page 11 shows the narrow entrance of the subway. And pages 12 and 12, 13 provide some scale of the entrances. I've been asked by our residents to include comment on how difficult or impossible the walkway is to negotiate to negotiate if you're in a wheelchair. The motorized ones seem to do okay, but occupy the entire space. Page 14 and 15 show the wall conditions of the walkway. We do note that in our area, along with many in the city, we have experienced increased vandalism, and keeping this pristine is a struggle, and I suspect in this instance they've just given up. Based on our experience with this and other sites, we're making the recommendations on our, our submission with the ability to affect change more quickly, considering Vision Zero. Transparent inspections of work sites with regular inspect, inspections that are published. Better communication to stakeholders. And then, in, in this instance, the monthly meetings with the developer have not worked. They can work better as we work, work They've worked for us with the developments on Hayden, but you need a cooperating developer who understands the purpose and value. Automatic review of sites when, when conditions change, such as the bike lanes here, and a transparent review of valuation in the report as it's measured against the guiding principles developed in 2017. Consistency throughout Toronto, this developer complained, why do I have to do this on this site and I don't have to do it elsewhere? Increased work zone coordinators. The workload on this, this one for one coordinator assigned to site is way too large to effectively oversee the construction activity and compliance with permits. How does this accomplish Vision Zero? We know the site has enjoyed COVID conditions, including longer work hours and decreased volumes of all forms of traffic. As indicated in our submission, to, together, National Post and Rogers have a current workforce of approximately three to 400 during COVID. Once these restrictions are lifted, that will expand to five to 7,000. This walkway will have to accommodate a portion of that work workforce. Vision Zero around these sites should be a proactive process, not a complaint-driven process. We realize that all our requests may be too late for this site, but we hope our experience and recommendations assist you for future ones. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Are there any questions of the deputy? I don't see any. Um, I believe that's all. Those are all the deputies. Are there any questions of staff? Councillor Wong Tam. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, through you to staff, how many work zone coordinators actually cover the, the area of Toronto East York? Yeah, 
Yeah, through the uh, through the chair to Councilor Wong Tam, we currently have uh, five work zone coordinators through the uh, the entire city. Uh, thank you. And are those uh, are the workloads distributed evenly uh, based on geography, or is it just one, one work zone coordinator uh, for, for example, Toronto Centre work? Their team are pretty busy, but do do we have one or two, or how how is that workload distributed? Um, through the chair to Councillor Wong Tam, we we have currently five. Um, there are greater numbers of wards of responsibility in the uh, Scarborough, North York, and Etobicoke, but in the downtown core, each work zone coordinator has approximately four to five wards of responsibility each. And approximately, how many files or sites does each work zone coordinator have to um, uh, take carriage of? How many are they responsible for? Well, each work zone coordinator um, has, you know, thousands, if not tens of thousands of requests annually for occupations of the right of way from utility cut permits, which we issue about 40,000 of those every year. Um, we have almost 200 active development sites currently in Toronto. And uh, then obviously we get involved with other comments around all of our street events that are now starting up this year as well. And we're engaged with our street events section. So and then all of our capital program on top of that, which is, uh, you know, in the hundreds of millions of dollar value to be delivered annually each year for uh, infrastructure improvements for roads and uh, waterworks. Thank you. Um so you just said that each work zone coordinator is responsible for thousands or tens of thousands of, of individual, I guess, permits and units of work. Um, it, everything from basic utility cuts to, you know, large development and then, you know, perhaps even uh, those around festivals. That's just still one human being that's got to take care of all of that. Is that what I'm hearing from you? Through the chair to Councillor Wong Cam, yes, you're correct. Okay. Um, and how many transportation standards officers are there in Toronto uh, and East York? Um, in Toronto East York District, we have 10 currently transportation standards officers responsible for monitoring and reviewing construction sites amongst other, other uh, you know, concerns that are, that are raised from residents and councillors as yourself. Okay, thank you. And then what's the difference between a work zone coordinator and the transportation standards officer? Um, we have different roles. The work zone coordinators are responsible for reviewing, approving, and commenting on traffic plans associated with all occupations on city right of way. The transportation standards officers are part of our permits and enforcement section, which they're responsible for you know, issuing summons to court and ensuring compliance with permit conditions. Thank you. Um, and so when a works, sorry, when a standards officer has to go to court to, to advocate on behalf of an infraction that they've uh, they filed, um, that takes that person almost out of the workplace and doing any further in enforcement, I'm assuming for half a day or at least a day. Is that a, a correct assertion? That's correct, Councillor. Okay. And then um, do you happen to know how many complaints have been logged in Toronto East York um, against uh, construction staging areas or perhaps infractions where developers are encroaching or just not following the rules, uh, general complaints. Do you know how many complaints you receive? Uh, uh, Councillor, I would have to uh, I would have to get some data on that. I can say that they do come in fairly frequently. Um, an exact number of those, I would have to go back to staff and find out an, a, a more precise number. But it, it's safe to say that we have thousands of complaints around construction sites of various magnitude throughout the city. You know, we're at the point that we really have to address the safety concerns immediately. That's our biggest concern. So when we do get a complaint around public safety, that's something that sort of between my team works on coordinators and also the transportation standards officers, we do take that very seriously and we try to respond as soon as possible to those types of uh, issues and complaints. Yeah, Craig, thank you very much. I appreciate your, your division is incredibly busy. Um, and because um, you don't have the information just sort of uh, globally, I wonder if you can disaggregate it with a, an estimate. How many complaints do you get per day um, around work zone infractions? Um, I think it pretty safe to say that we receive complaints on a daily basis. 
Okay, so but you cannot guess on a number. An I, I, I would hate to guess, counselor, and provide you with an inaccurate number, but I can certainly follow up with you. Okay, thank you. And so then, I my my final question is, how many fines have been laid against construction staging permit holders in Toronto, um, and uh, and and how many of those permit holders have been found not to be compliant? Uh, uh, regarding their permit conditions? Yes, Councillor, that that's taken care of by another section within transportation permits and enforcement. And I just don't have that number off the top of my head. Certainly when we get a complaint in my team, the work zone coordinator does the best to work out with the developer, the constructor, the applicant, um, you know, how, how we get resolution to, to a concern. So we try to work it out with them. Um, if we have difficulties working out compliance measures, then certainly it gets uh, it gets sent to our permits and enforcement section to have you know additional enforcement measures to to try to handle these these concerns. So a TSO transportation standards officer would be dispatched at that point, and then they have the ability to summons them to court and take further action above and beyond what my team can do. Okay, Craig, thank you very much for, for taking the time to answer my questions. That was very helpful. I don't well, have a question uh, based on that. Or is yours, Councillor Fletcher? Thank you. I, I just wondered, uh, you're talking about complaints coming in. Are you talking about 311 by any chance? The, uh, through the chair to Councillor Fletcher, yes, they, the, the majority of them do come through 311, although certainly through the councillor's offices, such as yourself, we do get those complaints forwarded to us. So there's a number of avenues that we receive these complaints, but I would say the lion's share would probably come from 311. And so if we look that up, what would we look up? What's the uh, designate for that complaint? That that would be, that would be through well it depends on the type of of concern it is if if it's based around construction staging areas I believe those are tracked separately um, and they would have a different problem code within TMMS um, I can again find out what those specific problem codes are but some of the complaints are separated based on problem codes and and what the yes. occupation is around so we could actually get a report on that at some point. Uh, the types of complaints around construction staging zones that public are experiencing, because you have the ability to aggregate that through three one one. Certainly, just as we had with snow, we had the same thing with snow. We got that ward by ward. Yes, okay, you're, great. You're absolutely correct. Thank you, Craig. You're welcome. Any other questions? Uh, seeing none, Councillor Wontam. Yes, thank you. Um, Ellen, uh, to our clerk, if you can help uh, put my motion onto the screen. Um, the motion is uh, asking, and actually it's directing the applicant to procure and install a um, shipping container, so one of the sea cans, uh, so that the pedestrian walkway is going to be entirely covered, uh, protected, unobstructed, uh, wheelchair accessible, um, and to do this concurrently or within a grace period is acceptable uh, to the acting director of traffic management, but not to exceed uh, more than three months. So therefore get it done as quickly as possible um, and uh, and to to make sure that it stays there for the entire duration of the construction period. Uh, further to that um, is uh, city council is asking the applicant uh, to provide sufficient number of pay duty uh, officers. Um, we need to make sure that people can get through this uh, corner very safely. Uh, right now, that is not the case, uh, especially when we have large construction vehicles bringing uh, materials uh, for, for loading and servicing. And sometimes it takes some time for them to actually um, uh, unload their, their materials. Um, it also means that um, when they pull out of that uh, sort of delivery zone, uh, it creates another hazard. So that every time a truck moves through the neighborhood or a vehicle, there's a potential for collision, potential for road violence. The rest of the motion is relatively uh, self-explanatory, but again, we're asking for the avoidance of light pollution, make sure you have this uh, sort of the shield barriers that point down so the lumens are not shining into people's windows, um, asking the applicant uh, to maintain the bike lane and to install appropriate signage to inform drivers well in advance 
that uh, there's maybe a change in the cycle lane so that they can expect uh, cyclists to, um, you know, unfortunately have to merge with traffic. Um, and then to have the applicant to, to continue to work through the construction management working group. And I know there has been significant uh, complaints from the community that that meeting hasn't been taking place. And then to provide regular monthly uh, communications to all the neighbors and stakeholders so that they're aware of what is actually happening on the site. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier in, in my remarks that, you know, we have stopped um, allowing developers to occupy <coughs> continuous roadway uh, for stretches of three to five years. Uh, it, was a, it was a hard lesson learned uh, simply because once the permit was out of our hands, uh, the developer can do just about anything. And sometimes you may have a very agreeable developer wanting to make things work with the community, but then you've got their general contractor, their project manager, sub-trades upon sub-trades, and it's a bit of a wild, wild west situation. Um, and not every developer controls um, and owns all the uh, all the sub-trades, so therefore uh, a lot of subcontractors. Um, and then the chain of command uh, is very um, incoherent. It's hard to tell who's in charge, uh, and, uh, and it becomes a colossal waste of our time and energy because uh, we're trying to hold the developer responsible, but the developer isn't able to hold their subtrades responsible. Um, and um, and I just want to flag that, you know, at, at the end of the day, we're, we've been trying so hard to ensure that pedestrians and cyclists and tolerable road users, including those who have used mobility device, can get through this intersection easily and safely. The most important thing is safety. And, uh, and, you know, Linda Brett was, was struggling to get onto the call, but she was determined to have her five minutes with us. So she had something very important to share with this uh, community council. Uh, and, and, and that sharing was the fact that she felt that the conditions on the roadway where this application is, is where this development is being constructed, was rendering her community and my community and our community and our residents unsafe. So even though it's going to cost more money for the developer, um, it, even though there's an inconvenience to, to the developer, unfortunately, this must be done. Uh, and we have seen in cases where there has been, uh, you know, really complicated development uh, and, uh, and a developer and their contractor has made it work. I've cited a great example at One Floor West uh, several times now at this uh, community council on, on where we have seen it work, where the sea cans are sort of stacked free. Uh, uh, three stories into the air. Um, it, it makes sense and uh, we have very few complaints. And then this site is just a generation of, of complaints. Um, I have, uh, you know, cyclists uh, tagging uh, my office and uh, everybody else from transportation on social media, asking that more be done, asking that, uh, you know, we revoke their permits, demanding that 3-1 run responds in a timely fashion getting an enforcement officer out there, all of those complaints are supposed to direct an action. And unfortunately, I think what we've seen is that the action is very much falling short. So there's a level of frustration that is generated by the neighbors, people who are trying to get from A to B and mostly from home to work. There's a level of frustration from those who are traveling through our neighborhoods that they feel that every time they pass this portion of the city, they have to take their lives in their own hand, which is so grossly unfair. I've walked it myself, I've biked it myself. It is woefully, woefully dangerous. Um, and, uh, and then the local residents association has to deal with their membership complaints. And then my office and my staff have to deal with those complaints. And what we've learned is, uh, thank you, Chris, um, Craig, for, for your answers. What we've learned is that we don't have enough staff. Once again, we're at back, to, back to the issue where we're asking so much of the public service. How, how is it possible that you have a work zone coordinator, five of them, in the busiest, busiest community council, not just here, but we're the busiest city city in all of Ontario. We've got five people managing tens of thousands of files and tens of thousands of permits. That is just not on. And if we want to fix it, we're going to have to deal with it, of course, through the budget process, but we're also going to have to empower staff to speak up and it's been very unfair, I think, in some ways, because I know some of the work zone coordinators um, have worked really hard. They've put in an unwinnable situation. The residents are upset that the work zone coordinator hasn't gone out to do his job, where, where he has gone out to do his job in this case, 
And then we have a developer who has said all the right things, but unfortunately didn't give us the outcome. So we've been left with no, no further option. We have to get it done. I know that the development is supposed to be finished um, by October, uh, maybe potentially November, but unfortunately, given the incredible risk to the community and public safety, they're going to have to tool down and they're going to have to put in safe passageway for pedestrians uh, for, for the cycling traveling uh, uh, lanes. Um, and so it is going to cost um, a little bit more, but I think that if it, if it averts an accident and, and, and any type of road violence, and we can save someone from serious injury or perhaps a life-threatening situation, then it is well worth it. Uh, and then we still have, as members of city council, we have some structural work to do to fix a structurally deficient problem with respect to how roads are managed, how our communities have to navigate these very dangerous conditions that all of a sudden appear out of nowhere. And, uh, and it's only up to us. We're the last line of defense we have to go to bat for our most vulnerable road users, and we also have to empower city staff so they can do a good job, and meet the service levels that residents expect. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any questions uh, for Council Longtown? Seeing none, do, uh, anyone else want to speak to the item? Okay. Uh, so I'll call those, all those in favor. Opposed, carry. Um, next, I'm going to deal with TE 31.88, <clears throat> the recipient of the 2022 Agnes McPhail Award. Uh, Councillor Fletcher or Councillor Bradford would Thank like you. to go. Thank you. Yeah. I held that, so I'll speak, Chair. Thank you so much. Um, I, I do have the staff here, but I think in the interest of time, I'll just move the motion and heartily support the um, nomination and award being going going to Cam Babulal, who is just amazing. Um, so I have that motion. And then I also have a second motion that was submitted to the clerk. So let's make sure that they have that. Just on a protocol matter while we're waiting, we can do that motion. And the second one after is that this is an award that goes back so far in East York, and it was a legacy award from the old borough of East York. It covers uh, my ward, Councillor Bradford's ward, and Councillor Robinson's ward. And it is um, all this community council and North York Council are both. Uh, approving this, we have to do that, and then it goes to council. Unlike other other awards or things that are local to the community council, this is actually a citywide one because it covers two community councils. So since that time, there um, the councillor, in particular, I know Councillor Davis, since two thousand and three, she had run this award through her office, which was uh, a lot of work working with the community. It's a community based group. And a number of years ago, protocol clerks stepped in because it is an award that's given out by the city. So we have kind of a hybrid here, and it would be helpful for the three councillors to understand what, how it came to be, what's happened, and now that clerks are working on it, or protocol is involved, are there any issues um, regarding role of the city in assisting versus a community-based award? So. Those things need to get ironed out, not making any changes, just starting that conversation. And I've spoken to Councillor Bradford about this motion. I'm looking at you there, Councillor. And, um, but not Councillor Robinson, because it's going to be going to, this motion would go to Council along with the award. So in speaking about the recipient, uh, she does live in front of Danforth. And every year for 25 years, she has spent immense amount of time prior to Christmas Day and running the show on Christmas Day to make sure 
upwards of this year, 390 seniors bought a hot turkey meal for their Christmas day. And moving from in-person seating and lovely venue at East York Community Center to deliveries. Um, so it's really quite, it's quite an amazing situation. And she also runs and works for the, um, through uh, Evangel Hall. She runs the food program out of there. I believe that's in your ward, Councillor Cressy, or whoever has Bathurst and Richmond in your ward. And she's quite amazing at that, plus anything that's needed in East York. So with that, I'm hoping that Ellen has had time to find that motion that was sent a while ago. But, um, uh, hmm. uh, to, through the chair, um, Councillor Fletcher, I'm sorry, I must have misunderstood. I thought the second part of your motion was not to be, um, um, well, I misunderstood. So um, I'm sorry. Yeah, that um, one is there. So, okay, I'll revise the motion and then put it up. It won't take very long. Okay, that's fine. Thank you very much. You can speak briefly if that's helpful to fill the time, Mr. Chair. And also because your remarks are important to us. Oh, great! Thanks. Well, here go we ahead. Go. The floor is yours. Yeah, wonderful. Thanks. Uh, I, I would just, uh, I'm fully supportive of Councillor Fletcher's motions that you're going to see here. I think this is a, a good, thoughtful process and conversation for us to have and engage in uh, in, in uh, the future of this uh, prestigious award that means a lot to our community and, of course, to, uh, to the City of Toronto as a whole. And so revisiting that process and what that looks like, uh, I think, is a, is a thoughtful measure, and I appreciate those motions. Um, more importantly, I want to just uh, offer my thanks and gratitude to Pam, this year's recipient. Uh, she is uh, a force for good in the East End and across the City of Toronto, as Councillor Fletcher alluded to. Uh, I've gotten to know her a little bit. Uh, admittedly, I didn't go uh, to too many of the East York seniors Christmas lunches prior to coming into office, uh, but it is a staple of my holiday season now. And, uh, you know, Cam's taken up that mantle for nearly two decades now, her and her partner, uh, an, a, an army of volunteers that are putting in their time and their talent and their treasure to make that happen. She is our fearless leader. It is a ton of work. Uh, and certainly during the pandemic, I think even more so trying to coordinate the logistics of delivering nearly 400 hot meals, turkey dinner to seniors across the East End uh, on Christmas. That's uh, no small logistical uh, feat. And it was the biggest it's ever been this year. So she's really unstoppable. Um, this, this, uh, she very much embodies the, the spirit and the ethos of the Agnes McPhail Award. She's a very worthy winner. Uh, we're lucky to have her. Um, I'm sure she will continue to serve in this capacity uh, because uh, Every year, I think we have the conversation sort of after the, <laughs> the dinner, and it's, uh, man, that was a lot of work. We need more people helping out. There's so much going on, and yet she's back time and time again, and it keeps getting bigger and better. So I think the origin of this actually goes back to former East York Mayor uh, David Johnson like a long, long time ago. And it is just, you know, in a city as big as ours, dynamic and diverse and changing, it is pretty cool to have these sort of traditions that come back year after year after year with new leaders like Cam who have uh, been doing it for the past two decades. So uh, kudos to you, Cam. Congratulations on the uh, the nomination and the big W here. And uh, can't wait to see the award ceremony. Very deserving. So that's it for me. Back over Thanks, Brad. I, I'm just going to fill in another second, though, Mr. Chair, because uh, this was reluctantly turned over to protocol after we dug forward, expanded the wards. It was quite manageable, I believe, when Councillor Davis was there as part of her work. But my staff basically assist everything in the dinner. That's almost a full-time job, and Carrie Stambler does a great job at that. Councillor Bradford does the um, levy, so we're keeping those East York traditions going. But the whole issue of... Um, because it is a city award, it seemed very fitting that that piece would move to protocol. Because as we've all pointed out, we just don't have the time and ability to do everything that used to happen in the smaller, more manageable boards. So that is one of the reasons why this motion will just ask for protocol to meet with Councillor Bradford, myself, and Councillor Robinson, and just look at the history. It's got a beautiful history. She's 
Agnes McPhail, amazing, amazing woman. And then are there any tweaks that have to get made or how can this be more successful? Because once it's a city award, how does that fit with being a community committee? It used to be run entirely out of Councillor Davis's office and um, there was little budget, I believe, coming through from the old borough. So one of those great legacy projects from our former cities that we want to make sure stays strong into the future. I don't know if Ellen has that ready. We'll just wait a moment. Oh, Mr. Fletcher, can you run your eyes over that? See yes, I'm intended? running my eyes over that. Thank you. Yes, we're approving that, and we're also um, that would be great. Thank you very Wonderful. much. Wonderful. Perfect. Okay. Thank you so much. So uh, <clears throat> why don't we take the amendment and the item together? All those in favor. Opposed, if any, that carries. Okay, give me one second. Uh oh. All right. Um, next, what I need to do is to have a motion to introduce TE 31.98 Pedestrian Safety, Don Lands Avenue, and Strathmore Boulevard. Moving that, Mr. Chair. Okay, all those in favor, opposed, carry. Uh, members that has been posted on the city's website. Uh, but what I'm going to do is just give everyone 30 seconds to run their eyes over it, or even 15 seconds. And then, uh, Councillor Fletcher, I'll turn the floor over to you. Thank you, uh, Alan. Thank you very much for all your help in getting that motion perfect. This is uh, the CTC second exit which I, any, any councillors that have any subway stations and have second exits across the city know it's a very difficult thing. We're adding in an incredibly complex piece of, of furniture for the subway into very highly developed and dense neighborhoods. So streets get closed, changes get made, parking, everything else. And this is always at a subway station, you have lots of buses. Unfortunately, at this point, and I think at this point, the TTC buses are parking on the street at a school, almost a Vision Zero issue. And I guess the message has gone out not to do that. I don't know what the problems are, but this is a pretty tough motion saying you got to fix that. You got to have a traffic warden. You got to fix something. Or as this project develops, uh, we'll have to change some of the permitting, including for. The, your transportation alleys here because it's a very very dangerous situation even more so during the snow so uh there is a motion here which is quite strong and i would obviously will be asking that look very quickly there's a date on there the 18th of february to sort it out thank you mr chair you're welcome are there any questions of the mover and if anybody's on the ttc i would appeal to them to I'll send them a motion. Any okay. questions of the move? Seeing none, does anyone else want to speak to the item? No? Okay. All those in favor? Opposed? That carries. Okay, so now all we have left is item T E uh, 3186 which is a uh, response to TE 30.39, uh, 49 Felstead Avenue, zoning matter, Ward 14. Uh, I understand, Councillor Fletcher, you want to go on camera on this item? Okay. Yes, please. Uh, if I could ask the clerk to uh, take the necessary steps to put the meeting in private session. Uh we need a motion, I believe, right? Uh, yes, um, to the chair, yes. Um, we do have to put a motion up, but I've been, would someone let me know um, what the reason for going into closed session is? If I could have someone, if it's- Mr. Fletcher, can you tell me the reason for going into closed that? Thank session? you. I guess it's too, because it's a, a legal matter. 
So uh, we need uh, confidential advice from the city's solicitor right. on a matter pertaining to the security and property of the city or on a pending court case. On a pending court case. Uh... Okay. Madam Clerk, does that give you enough? I just need a minute. Thank you. I'll get that ready. Okay, good. You've got that memorized, Councillor Ferg. Very good. You know, I love the fine print. We have a deputy clerk, and then we have a deputy deputy. You wear it well. Oh, no, no, no. I have no formal role. Just an overweening interest. I don't think we'll be very long in there, but we do have a motion. What are we doing? Okay, uh, Councillor Fletcher, would you mind moving this motion? Yes, I'd like to move that, please. To get some staff advice. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All those in favor? Opposed, if any, that carries. Uh, members of the public, we're going to be going into private session now uh, to deal with confidential advice from the city solicitor. We will be returning to public session after that is over. I, 
Thank you very much for your patience. And if we could just confirm that only those staff who are necessary for this item are remaining in the closed session. To the chair, this is the host. If you'll give us a moment to make those changes um, and this advice is to staff.
Okay, welcome back. Uh, Toronto East Jerk Community Council has concluded its in-camera session. No motions were moved in the in-camera session. Um, so we just have this one item remaining. Are there any public questions for staff? Seeing none, Councillor Fletcher, the floor is yours. Thank you. I would just move the following motion here. Staff have. Thank you. That's it. Okay. Would you like to speak to the motion? No, I'm fine. Thank you. Okay. Any questions of the mover? Nope. Uh, anyone else wish to speak to the matter? Nope. All those in favor of Councillor Fletcher's motion? Opposed? That carries. So I believe that completes our business and leaves us just with the confront the bills. Just give the clerk a few minutes to get the bills prepared. Oh, here we go. I'll just move these to for speed things along. That the Toronto East York Community Council pass and declare as bylaws bills 100 to 111 and 114 to 115 prepared for the February 16th, 2022 meeting 31 of the Community Council. All those in favor? Opposed? That carries. Next. But the Toronto East York Community Council pass and declare as a bylaw confirmatory bill to confirm the legislative proceedings of the Toronto East York Community Council acting under delegated authority at meeting 31 on February 16th, 2022. All those in favor? Opposed? That carries. And I believe, uh, Phoebe, that completes our business. <laughs> Phoebe should share. I can't the see. Meeting. Is that Phoebe? She's at the bottom of the screen. It's Chloe. Chloe, hi, Chloe. I'm so sorry. I can only see the top of your head. Hi, Kokomo. Say hi. Oh, I'm a little bit shy. We're giving her a wave. It's Chloe, we're all waving at you. Hi, everyone. Go bang on those drums. Make lots of noise for Daddy. <laughs> yeah, Daddy. Daddy loves it when you make noise on the drums. Especially when he's in a meeting. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Take Kirk. Care, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Everyone, Take please. Care. Like Ellen did an unbelievable job. Please give her your thanks when you can. <laughs>